Brett Fitzpatrick, Dark Galaxy Series, Book 4, Drifter Prime, narrated by David McCran, a book stream audiobook. Chapter 1 Princess Thagora was becoming ever so slightly fatigued from her morning swim, and the fitness tracking capability in the cybernetics implanted beneath the skin agreed. It whispered in her ear to tell her she could take a break for a well-earned rest, should she so desire. She started to tread water and look around for a pleasant spot to wait for her heart rate to come down to a level the fitness system was happy with. Her eyes were drawn to one of her favourite stretches of lakeside, the area below her temple. She was proud of her temple, when she remembered it existed at all especially because of the costs involved in moving it to its present location from a remote planet at the edge of her territories, simply to make her lake more retractive. She smiled and started swimming slowly toward it, gazing appreciatively at it as she approached. It was the kind of folly that, according to the xenoarchaeologist who sold it to her, symbolised unknown alien virtues that could only be guessed at by human minds. The temple was deserted, of course. After all, the whole planet was deserted apart from her and the robot servants who tended to her every whim. The location she had picked out for it was just perfect. It was part of the lake, but also part of the land, a kind of visual bridge between the two. The fragrances of incense from the surrounding trees was heavy on the air, and the sound of the chimes woven into their branches added to the calming atmosphere. It was, she suddenly and impulsively decided, perhaps her favourite spot on the entire planet. She came to a flight of half-submerged steps where she could stop swimming and plant her feet. The stone steps were almost vertical, leading the eye up to a soaring building on a platform of jade and sandstone. It was a pyramid with six levels, with six towers projecting on upwards from the building's main mass. She got comfortable in a position where she could admire her temple and also look out across the impeccable landscaping of her lake. As she lay on the steps, the lower half of her body immersed in the cooling waters of the lake, while her upper body was warmed by the planet's blue sky, she felt a bead of sweat appear on her forehead. The sun was a little too warm, she decided, frowning slightly as she called over to a glittering robot servant that was standing at the edge of the lake. We need a little more cloud cover, don't you think? she said to the robot. I agree, Highness, the robot said in reply, and I will see to it immediately. The robot nodded submissively, and soon large gravitic barges appeared above her and started seeding long streaks of cloud to shade the lake. Her frown eased as the hot embrace of the sun's rays was replaced by the planet's comfortable ambient warmth. Then the princess suddenly heard a noise, coming from within her folly, from somewhere deep within the temple. It was just the faintest whisper of a noise, hardly audible over the twittering of the small birds in the trees and the humming of the bejeweled insects. The princess propped herself up on an elbow and stared at the temple door. Suddenly, very slightly unsure of whether transferring an alien temple to the world she used for relaxation was such a good idea after all. She dismissed the thought a second later. After all, the xenoarchaeologist had certified the structure as entirely safe. She raised herself to her feet and climbed the steps that led up to the temple entrance. Tiny fish darted out of the way of her feet with every step until she had emerged from the lake completely. There were still many steps to climb before she would reach the door of the folly, and she paused, unsure if she should carry on. She looked round uncertainly and was pleased to see two robots not far away, both strikingly beautiful creations, a pair of sculptures in jade and gold. You, she said, pointing at the nearest of them. Go in there and tell me what you see. Certainly, Highness, the robot said. It unhurriedly climbed the steps and went through the door into the temple. The princess watched it ascend, then turned to the second robot. 
Can you see through the other robot's eyes? She asked it. I can, Highness, the robot told her. Then tell me what it sees, you dolt, she yelled at it. It sees the inside of a temple, the robot said hesitantly, as if this were some kind of trick question it hadn't managed to see through. Only that? the princess asked, already a little relieved. She had obviously imagined the noise. It was silly to allow such things to give her the heebie-jeebies. It happened sometimes, of course, alone on a pleasure planet, with just a few robots for company. A person's imagination could run riot. It was silly to allow such things to give her the heebie-jeebies. It was possible to imagine assassins had somehow penetrated the planet's space defences and made it down to the surface, that she was actually at risk of harm. But the royal family would never allow that. She was 17th in line to the provincial throne, and her life would never knowingly be allowed to be put at risk. It's just a silly old ruin, isn't it? She said with a smile. Exactly, Highness, the robot graciously agreed. Well then, the princess said, have your friend come back out and we can decide how I'm next to be entertained. Of course, Highness, the robot said, though there is one thing. What is it? the princess asked. Well, out with it. What is it you want to say? The interior of the temple seems to have been redesigned since my colleague was provided with its plans, the robot said, its voice a mixture of confusion and disappointment. This is not the order of things. We surface robots should be given up-to-date plans of all surface structures, both their interior and ex- What are you blithering about? the princess said sharply. The whole point of this folly is that it is a long dead lump of alien architecture. Nobody has redesigned the interior. I beg to differ, Highness, the robot said humbly, and raising its hands in a gesture of supplication. When schematics of this structure were provided to me, there were four interior spaces joined together by one circular connecting corridor. Yes, the princess nodded. I remember from when I picked it out, a most pleasing arrangement. Well worth the cost involved in bringing it here to add interest to these gardens. But now, the robot said, offering no opinion on whether the billions spent in relocating the ancient structure were well spent. There is only a single interior space and a single corridor going deeper into the structure. On patrol in the deserts of yet another backwater planet, where the independent colonists needed imperial help to pull their fat out of the fire, Vela saw one of the biomechanical creatures. It was half a kilometre away, and it wasn't alone. There were five of them, scuttling among the dunes of the endless sand sea, where they had no business being. She activated her communicator with a sharp jab of her finger. Coordinator, she growled. I have more buzzer contacts. Five of them. No, wait. Six. That's a whole squad of them, and they're all warriors. Who designated this quadrant as pacified? Nobody gives information like that to lowly slugs like me, her sector coordinator Garton said. Just deal with them, okay? Sand mining operations are starting any day now. While she was talking to Garton, Vela's view screen was showing her a close-up of the nearest buzzer. It was a gruesome creature, as big as a horse, and covered in a chitinous shell that was half metal, half some organic substance. It had four legs underneath its huge insectile body and four arms near the front. At her command, the view widened to encompass the entire squad of buzzers, revealing that they were carrying various combinations of weapons and equipment. The nearest one to Vela's position had a huge mass driver in one of its clawed hands and a wicked laser-sharp blade in another. Atop all this was the head, the vicious alien head. It was a blank mass of metal with two deep pits where the eyes should have been. But buzzers didn't have eyes, just two dark sensor pits. The creatures were an entirely alien life form, and their blank faces made them seem almost impossibly unknowable. One thing was for sure, though, they were belligerent and had advanced military technology. 
a lot of the technology was actually grafted into their bodies, including huge capacitors to drive it. This was how they had come by the name buzzers. You could hear an electronic whine or buzz in the air if you were ever unlucky enough to be actually standing near one, generated by all the cybernetic systems implanted into their bodies. Vela killed the communicator. Talking to Garten was a waste of energy at the best of times, and with so many buzzers scuttling around, it could be a deadly distraction. She needed to concentrate and get her job done. She had ten drones, and theoretically that should be plenty to deal with even six buzzers. Her drones were Scorpion class, not the best drones ever built. The men and women of the scattered Tarazet colonist assist fleet were never given the best equipment. But the Scorpion class unstable terrain drone wasn't bad either. They were the most intelligent drones she'd ever controlled, that was for sure. The leader of the pack was designated Scorpion 1, S1 in her tactical displays, and it was already suggesting attack patterns. Most of them were rated by her tactical systems as likely to bring victory, and two of them were predicted to bring victory with no loss of her own units. One predicted an encounter lasting four minutes, while the other predicted an encounter of just two minutes before victory. No brainer, Vela muttered, as she selected the two minute option and battle was joined. Two scorpions, S4 and S9, charged at one of the buzzers, ganging up on it, and she smiled. Her scorpions looked magnificent in her viewer, which was showing a video feed provided by S6. Her drones, as the name suggested, were designed to look like scorpions one of the most ubiquitous forms of life in the galaxy after humans and rats. Wherever humans went, scorpions somehow hitched a ride and went with them. Each drone was covered in thick plates of armour, painted in a desert camouflage pattern, and each had a blaster mounted in a flexible tail, along with two claws for physical combat. To add to the beauty of the tableau, the planet's big sun was on the horizon, casting long shadows and rimming the mechanical combatants in outlines of gold, leaving only the small, secondary sun high in the sky to fill in the details of the scene with its milky ochre. When the main star dipped below the horizon, the temperatures would drop to something a human might find tolerable. But right now, the atmosphere was still shimmering with unbearable heat. The drones, of course, didn't really care what temperature it was. The buzzer being ganged up on opened fire on S4, which was a little closer to it. The rods fired from its mass driver flew at S4 at relativistic speed, accelerated by a magnetic coil before being launched from the muzzle. The scorpion's shields, generated by compact tangles of machinery in its belly, weren't able to deflect them, just slow them down so ablative armour was sent fountaining into the air from its back. It scuttled forward unperturbed across the sand, ignoring the fearsome wound that had been opened in its back, eager to bring its claws into contact with the buzzer's armour. Its tail-mounted blaster fired as it advanced, the gun eerily steady as the drone scuttled and jumped through the dunes. The blaster projected packets of energy at the buzzer that glowed like fireflies, but the monster had shields too, projected by machinery buried somewhere beneath its carapace, and it deflected them. And then S4 was on the alien biomechanoid, its claws stabbing and clasping at the monster's armour. The buzzer defended itself, slicing off one of the scorpion-class drone's legs with its wicked blade, but the scorpions were indomitable, especially in close combat. The other drone, S9, fired off a couple of shots with its blaster when it was sure it wouldn't hit S6, and things were starting to look bad for the buzzer. And then the sand behind S6 moved. Powers, Vela cursed. Two more buzzers were emerging from the sand and launching a surprise attack on S6 from behind. Vela checked her tactical display and the likelihood of victory predicted by her tactical computers was dropping quickly. Sneaky little, 
Vela's invective died on her lips as she saw that S-1 was already suggesting a new attack formation. Scorpion-1, she noticed, was in combat itself. It had one buzzer by the neck, held tight in its claw, while it was forcing another to keep its head down with suppressing fire from its tail blaster. But it still had processing power enough to constantly be suggesting changes that would raise their chance of victory. Vela reluctantly agreed, even more reluctantly because she saw that the new plan required her to get involved in the action. Up until now, she had been sitting back, overseeing the drones as they did their work, but now she was going to have to mix it up with the drones and buzzers like some damn fool infantry slug. She slipped her hands into feedback gauntlets and pressed a button to fold away her command chair as she stood up and took a step. Her body remained in place, held above a circular plate by gravitic forces. But the robot power armour she was inside, gladiator-class battle armour, moved a step forward. Giant mechanical knee, hip and ankle joints whined and grumbled as her foot was lifted in the air, then came smashing down. Then she took another step, and another. Theoretically, the robot she was piloting could run, but shifting sands were not the terrain to give that manoeuvre a try. She walked steady towards where S1 had requested her to be, and she arrived just in time to make the difference. Her robot armour had four blasters mounted in the chest that all targeted one location. She designated her first target, a buzzer that was in the process of cutting one of her scorpion drones in half and started firing. Even suspended above the grav plate, she felt the recoil of the blasters as they summoned huge energies from the armor's capacitors, formed them into packets of destruction and hurled them at the buzzer. Gratifyingly, its shields were overloaded and it was blasted apart. The scorpion it had been hacking away at was badly damaged dragging itself across the sand and leaving a trail of vital fluids. But it was still functioning, for now, and that meant it was still firing. Vela allowed herself a small smile as the likelihood of victory climbed back towards a certainty. Her drones continued blasting and ripping apart the buzzers one by one. Then her tactical computer chimed for her attention momentarily lowering the sound of battle coming through the speakers in the cockpit of her robot armour to make sure she didn't miss the signal. Her robot armour's sensors were telling her that a buzzer was emerging from a sand dune. She couldn't see it because of all the sand hanging in the air kicked up by the feet and blasts of both her drones and the buzzers. But the detection looked good. It didn't look like a false positive to her so she trusted her sensors and started firing. Blaster bolt after blaster bolt pounded the dune, sending even more sand hurtling into the air, accompanied by shards of glass caused by her blasters heating the sand. Her tactical computer hadn't gotten its predictions exactly on the nose, unfortunately, and she saw the buzzer emerge from the sand a few feet to the left of where she had been firing. It raised its mass driver to shoot back at her. Damn sensors, she cursed, as she glanced at the head-up display, looking for the readout that would tell her the state of her shields. They were still at 100%, so there was no chance of a buzzer with a mass driver being able to take her out, at least very little chance. The alien biomechanoid was a good shot and the armoured glass across the front of her robot's head was cracked and pockmarked by its rapid-fire shots, while one of her shield generators overheated and went offline with the effort of keeping the robot's head from being blown off completely. She glanced at the tactical computer's prediction of her victory chances. They were still hovering in the high 70s, but her chances of winning without losing a drone had dropped to zero. By the end of the combat, she had lost three drones and her armour suit was badly damaged. The buzzers had been very cunning with their ambush and had very nearly taken her and her drones out. She switched on her communicator again, mentally formulating some salty language to use on Gartan. 
Vela was sent back out on patrol the very next day, despite regulations mandating a day off after an encounter with buzzers. She hadn't been expecting it. Garten wasn't one for rules, not ones that made his duty rosters harder to draw up anyway. As her giant robot armor took step after step, she realized she started to hate the planet she was currently stationed on. It was a mud ball, but that wasn't the problem. Something else was eating at her, something she couldn't put into words. The planet was mostly a hellscape of dunes and heat, but interspersed here and there was marshland and open water. Her towering robot armor was equally at home in the shallow waters of the marshes as it was in the dunes, but her scorpion drones didn't perform well in an aquatic environment. Instead, she was wrangling a small flotilla of submersible drones, each armed with a mass driver turret. They were called wave slicers, and Vela hated them with a passion. They were so much stupider than the scorpions she was given for desert patrols that she had to work hard just to stop them shooting at each other. The wave slicers were a pain in the neck, but that wasn't it either. There was some other reason she was starting to hate this planet. She was now where the water of the marshes was deepest. It came up just below the chest of the giant robot she was piloting. The reeds projected two to three meters higher still, and so only the head of the robot was visible as she strode through the water. She glanced at the reeds, registering their beauty on an intellectual level, but not feeling it viscerally any longer, after spending too damn long on the planet. Unlike the planet of her birth, where the reeds were a monochrome blue, the reeds on this planet had evolved, for some reason only a biologist would be able to explain with a beautiful pattern of alternating stripes of green and yellow travelling up their shafts. It made the view through the transparent armour in front of her a shimmering vista. The armour was still cracked, from where that buzzer had hit her with mass driver fire the day before, but the damage was cosmetic and didn't impede her view of the beauty of the marshes. There was danger here too, obviously or she wouldn't be stationed here pacifying the place for the mining company that had bought it. The buzzers, the few that remained on the planet, were just as at home among the reeds of the marshland as they were among the dunes of the deserts. But it wasn't the buzzers that were getting to her, at least not exactly. They were part of it, their strange alien presence, palpable on the planet's air, but it was more than that. She had a feeling of impending doom. She saw the surface of the water break up ahead of her as a particularly impressive example of the planet's megafauna broke the surface and stared at Vela. The air was suddenly full of the warning cries of animals hidden in the reeds, alarmed at the appearance of the monster. And it was quite a sight. She could only see its head, basically a large mouth, on the end of a stubby but flexible neck. Its face was covered in a red and black pattern of interlocking and elongated scales that made it look evil and intelligent. The armor's computer identified it with a little arrow and a text window in her heads-up display, including a fanciful scientific name, and assigned it a threat level of low. Among the text accompanying the identification, she noticed an extract from the planet's development plan that said the creature was earmarked to be hunted to extinction within the first two years of the planet coming online for full resources production. The beast lost interest in her and descended below the surface again. She felt sorry for the alien thing. It had absolutely no idea of the fate awaiting it. It had been earmarked for extermination by the Tarazet Star Empire and there wasn't a damn thing the dumb beast could do to avoid this fate, even if it had been capable of understanding it. Its doom had been sealed. Vela slumped down in her quarters, in the only chair fixed to the floor alongside her small window. The window was about the size of a food tray, and it looked out onto the newly terraformed world. She hadn't bothered to switch on the illumination in her quarters, so the bright light of the planet's suns lanced into the room like the beam of an ion cannon. Vela watched motes of dust dance in the sun's beams, 
Little points of light that reminded her of numerous star maps she had seen in numerous tactical hologram projectors. She was roused from meditating on the beauty of the dust slowly whirling in the shaft of sun by her door chiming. Who is it? she asked her room computer. It is Romina, the device told her. Vela raised an eyebrow and looked at the door, wondering why one of the unit's lone wolves was coming to pay a visit. Let her in, Vela said. Vela's room was so small that Romina was invading her personal space just by entering it. Romina went and stood on the other side of the window from Vela. Help yourself to a drink, Vela offered, pointing at a food and drink fabricator recessed into the wall next to her elbow. Romina punched a couple of buttons and a beaker of some oily-looking liquid was excreted from one of the unit's nozzles. What is that? Vela asked. It's a little recipe I picked up someplace or other, Romina said, her voice a tortured and digitized rasp, thanks to some neck injury she had picked up somewhere. I seem to remember. It's called a slammer. Sounds interesting, Vela said. Could you dial one of those up for me? Sure, Romina said. She punched the buttons for another slammer and handed the beaker to Vela once it had been extruded by the small economy model food fabricator. As Romina passed the drink across the short distance between them, it was caught for a moment by the beam of intense light coming from the room's little window. It shone a warm amber, with swirling clouds of some darker substance within. To the powers, Romina said, raising her glass. Sure, those bastards, Vela said, raising hers and bashing the plastic edge against Romina's with a dull clunk. They both took a sip, and Vela was pleasantly surprised. It was potent, burning a fiery trail across her tongue, but the taste was smooth without being sweet. She smiled approvingly and made a mental note to save the drink's settings. What do you want, Romina? Vela asked, pretty sure the woman wasn't going to open her mouth unless invited to. I need a teammate, she said. Vela was vaguely aware that some of the other slugs had an informal grav ball game going, and the base's single grav dome was the scene of constant training, practice and games. But Romina had never struck her as the type to be particularly interested in team sports. I don't play grav ball, Vela said with a dismissive gesture of the hand. Hunting buzzers is enough sport for me. Romina laughed, a short electronic snorting noise that was even more unsettling than her synthesized voice. She took another sip of her drink. How much surveillance crap is left in your room's computer systems? She asked. One of the first things Vela did whenever she moved into new quarters for anything more than a day or two was thoroughly strip the bloat out of any room's computer preset. The trick was to purge all the stuff used by the government to spy on you, but leave some crap so the system didn't look too clean. It was a balancing act, but Vela thought she was at least as good at it as anyone else. We can talk, she assured Romina. Okay, Romina nodded taking her word for it. I have an offer of employment. How much does it pay? Right now, you're a slug, Romina reminded her. Infantry, the lowest of the low. So whatever it pays, it's going to be better than what you get now. Infantry pay isn't bad, Vela countered, compared to what I was getting back on Yabarith for climbing yen vines and cutting the fruit nine times out of ten on a branch too twisted to use a harness so it was as dangerous as the infantry too. It's more, Romina assured her. A lot more. Exactly how much more? Seven times more, Romina told her in an electronic whisper. Vela spat out the sip of slammer that had been in her mouth, spraying it across the grubby floor of her room. Powers, she cursed. But I thought I just heard you say it was seven times more. You heard right, Romina said. What the hell kind of job are you offering me? Vela asked. Are you promoting me to Admiral? Admirals get a shitload more than just seven times what a slug gets, Romina said with a smile. No, it's pretty standard for mercenary work. Your tour is nearly up and I need a partner for a job I have lined up. 
You can sign on for another year in the infantry. You can go home and cut yen nuts, or you can sign on with me. They aren't nuts, Vela said. It's more a kind of squash. Ramina just narrowed her eyes. What would I need to do? Vela asked. The exact same thing you do here. Wrangle drones, do patrols, and shoot anything that the bosses need shooting. Simple as that. What kind of drones will we have? I can't tell you that unless you sign on, Romina shrugged. But I can tell you they're a lot better than the crap we have here. Vela nodded, considering her options, but she already knew which way she was going to decide. Romina and Vela left the planet on Romina's spaceship, a sleek delta wing that looked too expensive for a soldier to own. Romina sat at the controls, while they climbed to escape velocity and reached open space, but then left the ship's AI to look after the rest of the flight's duties. She then went to Vela in the spaceship's little ready room. Now I can start to give you a little more information about what we are going to be doing, Romina said, starting with the equipment we'll be using. Okay, Vela said, butterflies in her stomach at the turn her life was taking. Stay home to climb the vines, or go off to be cannon fodder for whoever happened to be besmirching the title of the emperor or empress at that particular moment. That was the question most young people on her home planet had to decide on. Now life was taking her down a very different path. She could feel that, and that was what she had wanted. But she still had no idea yet about whether her decision was taking her toward a bright future or just a different grim death than the one ordained for her by the Navy. We will be using a type of drone you have never probably seen before or even heard of, Romina said. We'll be using Wender 560s. As Romina said this, a hologram sprang into life in the middle of the ready room table, projected from a hologram pit recessed in the ceiling above. Oh, I'm sorry, Romina said reading the caption floating alongside the drone depicted in the hologram. It actually looks like we'll be getting Wenda 575s. Vela nodded, but her attention was on the hologram, which showed a bipedal drone which the scale said was about seven feet tall. It had just two arms and a head that looked like a mixture of armour, sensors and communications gear. It was a very elegant design to Vela's eyes. There was something about the way the sensors were mounted deep in the head armour that made it look capable, menacing almost. They looked like the beady eyes of a spider, though the design only had four of them, not eight. It wasn't heavily armoured, but she could see attachment areas for extra armour, should it be required. There's no fixed weapon, Vela noticed, reading through the panels of text that were floating beside the depiction of the drone. No. Romina said. They're for the birds. We need to adjust our armament to the situation. That's why I chose a versatile design like the Wender. It's got two gripping hands and numerous attachment points. We can hang just about anything we want on it, short of an iron cannon. Okay, Vela nodded. She didn't know the mission yet, so she couldn't comment on whether Romina was right about them not needing a fixed weapon. You find so many fixed weapons on Navy drones, Romina carried on, because the Navy gets a better deal if they buy drone and weapon system from the same manufacturer. By the powers, Vela said, pointing at the hologram. Is that specification a typo? No, Romina said, grinning for possibly the first time since the night she had rung Vela's bell to recruit her. Those numbers are right. I've never seen processing capacity like that in a drone before. I bet you haven't, Romina smirked. Not as a slug fighting for the Tarazet Deep Space Navy. Chapter 2 Shavia stood on the bridge of the Raven, her right-hand woman Falu at her side. Both were gazing at the spaceport as the ship descended gracefully toward it the Starcraft's computer doing the work of actually bringing it in for a touchdown. They were coming down on one of the numerous landing pads scattered around the upper slopes of a huge complex of almost perfectly circular buildings, 
each one the size of a city block. I've always enjoyed visiting this planet, seeing this ancient style of architecture, Shavir said. A little too old-fashioned for my taste, Felu said. Oh yes, Shavir nodded. Of course, from the viewpoint of aesthetics, it is hideous, but that's not what I was talking about. No, Felu could tell her boss wanted to talk, to explain something, so she patiently waited for the lecture to begin. This ancient architecture symbolizes something, Shavir continued. At the heart of each of these structures is a shielded chamber, where hologram communication is not only forbidden, it is impossible. If you want to be included in the deliberations that take place here, you have to come in person. Without these structures, this would be just another backwater planet, a place without any strategic or economic value. But this complex puts it at the very heart of the government of the Tarazit Star Empire. Communication shielding is commonplace, Fallu said. A similar complex could be built just about anywhere. Exactly, Shavir said with a grin, her voice almost triumphant. So why does almost the entire upper echelon of the imperial nobility up sticks and travel here every few years? Fallu simply looked at her boss. She knew the question was rhetorical. Tradition, Shavir said, answering her own question. That's why momentous decisions have been made within the halls of these hideous buildings for thousands of years. And that will continue to happen here for thousands of years to come. Inertia is a terribly powerful force, fellow. Whatever shape the Empire takes, its heart is always located here. And the current crisis is to resolve the Imperial succession, Fallu said, distractedly, her eye momentarily caught by a particularly extravagant shuttle design that was coming down on a nearby pad. The new emperor has been crowned and announced here for thousands of years, Shavir said. Some indefinable emotion in her voice, Fallow suspected it might be something akin to pride in imperial tradition. Announced, yes, Fallow said with a smile, but not enthroned. Some of them haven't actually made it to the crowning, what with one thing and another, bad health, assassination, that sort of thing. In the bad old days, Shavir said, nothing so distasteful has happened in modern times. So which one of these idiots is going to be given the nod? Fallow asked, gesturing at the luxury shuttles coming into land all around. Shavir waved a hand, and seven hologram figures appeared, all standing as still as statues. Each was dressed in the fine clothes of nobility, and each had a percentage chance of winning hovering around their chest area constantly updating with increases and decreases of a few fractions of a percent. Lady Tanmay, Fallu said, pointing at the figure in the centre. Fifty-five percent? She's out in front by a comfortable margin, and she'd make a wonderful empress. Are you crazy? Shavir gasped in shock and disgust. She is the last person we want on the throne. Too intelligent, too independent, too ruthless. Life with her as an empress would become considerably more complicated. We need a dolt, a freaking moron, somebody who can be easily shown how important the Ministry of Science is and how vital it is that we keep receiving at least the same cut of the tax pie we always have. I see, Falou said, aware that Shavir was still giving her hostile side-eye, as if considering the possibility she might be an agent of Lady Tanmay's. Who would you prefer to see as our leader? Shavir walked all the way to the end of her holographic mannequins and stopped at Lord Bella, given a 4% chance according to the computer that Shavir had tasked with calculating the odds. Look at this beautiful fool, she said. Not an idea in his head, no strength of character, not much in the way of leadership skills or even ordinary people's skills. He would be ideal. Is that realistic? Fallu asked. Can you really put an ignoramus like Lord Bella on the throne? Probably not, Shavir said, with a wistful smile and a sigh that almost sounded like she was imagining the prospect, and reluctantly letting it go. But a girl can dream, can't she? Fallu didn't see Shavir again for days. 
Shivir was whisked away into a world of overstuffed divans, tiny portions of food, bejeweled androids and complex music being played on complex instruments by masters of their craft, the backdrop against which she attempted to use her influence to get her preferred candidate enthroned as emperor, while Fallow stayed aboard the Raven, dealing with day-to-day -day business of running the Ministry of Science in her absence. It was Fallow, therefore, who took the call from Brax, an emergency call on the highest priority connection. Fallow, the android said, nodding his head politely. I must speak with Shavir. That is not possible, Brax, Fallow told him. Shavir has a series of meetings within the chambers of the Jade Forest Palace. The chambers are screened to prevent communication. By the powers, Brax cursed. Why? What can there be of any interest there? The election, Fallu told him. The Empire needs a new head to lead it. Ah, yes, of course, of course, Brax said. Is there no way to get a message to her? I can take it into her by hand, Fallu said. But for me to do that, it would have to be a matter of the utmost urgency. What could be more important than the election of a new Emperor? Drifter Prime, Brax said. There's been a change. Oh, Fallu said, paused a second, glanced at the day-to-day -day business of the science ministry, arrayed around her on floating holographic screens, then back at Brax. I'll go get her. I would appreciate that, Brax said, his hologram already fading. Call me when you found her. Finding Shavir proved more difficult than Fallu had thought it was going to be. She had imagined there would be some sort of big negotiating room where all the power players, of whom Shavir was definitely one, would be hammering out some kind of compromise. That proved not to be the case. Instead, there was a maze of small chambers where there was an endless succession of banquets, music, recitals, theatre plays, poetry slams and other elite entertainments. Fallow could only suppose the deals were being done there, but the problem was there was only a narrow window of time between one event ending and another starting when it was possible to gain entrance. Once a meal or a dance had started, the doors were locked and Fallow was not allowed in. This wouldn't have been so bad if it had been possible to find out who was inside each event without waiting till the end to see who actually emerged. It was a huge waste of time, introducing enormous uncertainty and delay into choosing a new emperor. It could only be by design, Fallu supposed, but she had no idea why. At last, Fallu spotted Shavir coming out of a music performance, where a tall, slim man had been playing some device that looked half like a bass drum and half like a trumpet, with controls built into the lapels of his jacket. Fallu, Shavir yelped in surprise. Lady Shavir, the young assistant said, urgent news. By the powers it better be, Shavir muttered as she came over. Tell me what it is that is so important, a buzzer invasion of the Tarazet homeworld perhaps? I can't say, Fallu whispered. I'm to take you to the Raven so you can take the call there. Ah, Fallu! Shavir said, her eyes drawn to a group of people moving into a small, intimate dining room, or the closest thing to one to be found in the complex at any rate. It was still built on a scale that was huge by normal standards. This is not the time. I have a lot of irons in the fire. I'm sorry, Falu said. Shall I tell them, uh, caller that you will, um, call back later? Who is the caller? Shavir asked. I hesitate to say, Fallu replied. Even that is sensitive information. Okay, Fallu, damn you, Shavir said. But if this turns out to be nothing, I'll have you shot. The hologram of Brax was brightening into existence in front of Fallu and Shavir. Fallu respectfully at a distance, sitting in one of the plush seats of the Raven Bridge. Shavir was pacing in little circles, but she stopped when Brax had completely coalesced. What is it, Brax? Shavir hissed. And I warn you, this had better be good. 
Her eyes kept darting from the hologram to the bridge window and to the palace complex beyond that she had just been called away from. Brax, an AI encased in a humanoid body, was standing at the intersection of two corridors, looking at a hologram of Shavir as it gradually faded. The last glimmerings of light faded from the hologram projector mounted in his chest, and Shavir was gone. She had not been happy to be taken away from her machinations at the gathering to elect a new emperor, but she hadn't fired him or ordered his execution, so he was pretty sure contacting her had been the right thing to do. He had absolute privacy, of course, far below the surface of the artificial alien planet. Nobody would know he had called the boss. He was standing in a cavernous space, with a hexagonal floor plan and hexagonal arches supporting the ceiling above. The enormous space could be reached from two directions, through towering corridors with a hexagonal cross-section. Brax raised his head and looked from left to right. His android face was less expressive than a human's. He had selected a body to house his intelligence that had a face with fewer face muscles than a human had, but even so, it wasn't difficult to see that he was uneasy. There was nothing to do now but wait. Shavir had given him instructions on how to deal with his current situation, and it would be foolish not to follow her orders to the letter. Many hours later, a taxing amount of time to stay in one place without doing anything useful, even for an android, he heard the whining of a transport grav motor approaching. It was very soft, a long distance away. Brax folded his arms behind his back and waited for it. The utility vehicle came floating through one of the corridors and slowed to halt just a few yards away from him. Two human forms emerged and crossed the short distance from the utility vehicle to Brax. Neither of the new arrivals said a word and Brax didn't bother to say hello to them. Just like Brax, they too seemed to lack the normal vitality of a human, both standing just as still as the android. A feat even the most disciplined of human would ordinarily find difficult to copy. They were both wearing grey uniforms with no markings of rank or status. They both also wore distinctive black headgear, half helmet, half hat. This corridor is new, Brax said, feeling uncomfortable with the silence. Neither of his companions answered. He hadn't phrased his remark as a question, nor invited them to comment. Neither of them felt the slightest inclination to engage in small talk with the android. Brax pulled out a communicator and contacted Posia, one of the senior scientists on his team. His communicator was glitching and refused to automatically send his coordinates for them to come and find him. He had made sure to sabotage it to achieve this effect before coming to this place, so he had to just tell her where he was. That's impossible, Posia said. There isn't a corridor intersection at those coordinates. You must have them wrong. Just get into a vehicle and come out here. It took Posia twenty minutes to get there, though Brax heard the whine of her vehicle's engines approaching long before that. The little grav car came barreling up at last, much faster than regulations allowed, and stopped alongside Brax and the two figures in grey. A gullwing door hissed open, and Posia climbed out, and she frowned when she saw the two figures in grey. What are those tome mutants doing here? she muttered. Procedure, Brax said. Posia was about to say something else, then thought better of it. It was a very minor detail in comparison to what Brax had claimed over the communicator about changes to the architecture of Drifter Prime. So you're telling me this is a whole new corridor, are you? It is undeniably here, Brax said, as the gullwing door on the other side of the little car opened. And it absolutely should not be. This is gigantic, the woman getting out of the other side of the car said as her face appeared above the car's ceiling. Enormous! Unprecedented! It is certainly unprecedented, Yatena, Brax said, 
As far as we know, this artificial planet has not done anything on this scale for hundreds of years, more likely thousands or even millions. But now it is undeniably starting to perform operations. This is the largest of them so far, but not the most significant. Perform operations, Posia said. That's quite a vague way to describe the building of an entirely new corridor. We're going to have to be vague for now, Brax warned them. Whatever this is, there is no indication that the planet is actually coming alive or waking up or any romantic notion like that. These are simple housekeeping operations designed to make logistics easier, nothing more than that. But even that is huge, Yatena said, just the biggest of the big. Posia smiled at her colleague's enthusiasm. I guess it's my job to ask the stupid questions, so why now? It isn't exactly now, Brax said. This process has been underway for some time. And you didn't think to tell us, Yatena growled. This is a very special development, and we must proceed circumspectly and with caution, Brax explained. How long has this been going on? Posia asked. How long has it been since you noticed the start of this? Operation, Brax said, finishing her sentence for her. Yes, exactly, Posia said, and took a step toward the android. How long? It started only a short time ago, relatively, Brax said, and I think I can safely say that the process, whatever it is, is very slowly accelerating. I'll contact Shavir, Posia said. No, Brax said. No, Posia said. No, Yatena repeated, incredulous. All communications with Shavir must go through me, Brax said, for now. It's better for everyone. Shavir is distracted, what with manoeuvring for favour with whatever new emperor or empress ascends the throne. At the gathering of electors is where she can do the most good for now, ensuring the science ministry continues to enjoy the status it had under the old emperor. I will make sure she is kept up to date with whatever information she needs to know. She's playing politics? Posia was incredulous. But we need her. She is the leading expert on drifter technology in the Empire. There is another, Brack said. Who? Posia snorted derisively. Altea, Yatena whispered. Posia's face gradually fell as second after second went by and Brax didn't deny it. You can't be serious, Posia said. She is an outlaw. If Shavir even suspects you have shared information like this with Altier, she'll, she, she'll have you melted down. Chapter 3 The flagship's planning room was much bigger than the bridge, with large hologram pits constantly showing the tactical computer's best guesses about the battlefield they were jumping into, along with holograms generated by the ship's strategic cause, showing the various ways the battle interacted with the rebellion's greater objectives. In the middle of everything, dominating the room, was a timeline. It was like a series of columns, each one showing time passing, sweeping from top of each column downwards in a wave of red. The wave of red constantly ate away the remaining green, which represented time to come. There were five columns, like the five fingers of a human hand, and each one showed time passing at a different rate. The one on the extreme right showed just ten seconds, so the red wave came sweeping down six times a minute. The next column showed one minute, so the red wave moved downward more slowly. The next column showed ten minutes, meaning you had to look at it a while to notice it was moving at all. The next column showed one hour, so the red wave looked essentially stationary. The last column showed an entire standard day, and Xenia knew it was moving, intellectually, but it looked as static as an immovable object. At that precise moment, the red wave was halfway down the slowest column. Looking closer, Xenia could see that halfway between the shore of the red inundation and the base of the column, in the middle of the green area of future time, 
an event was marked. The event was labelled arrival in system, and it would be the beginning of a lot of hasty manoeuvring and the start of fighting in earnest for control of the eleventh planet. They were only five hours out from what would undoubtedly be the biggest battle the rebels had thus far been involved in. If the Empire hoped to nip their rebellion in the bud, they would have to do it now, and they knew that. Xenia looked away from the giant hologram of the chronograph and noticed that the captain was in a huddle with two robots and a crew member with extensive cybernetic augmentation, who was attached to a huge data bus by cables as thick as forest vines. The cables were bundled together in collars like dreads and held up off the floor by little grav motors, giving the crewman some degree of mobility, but the weight of the cables was still tugging his head back at an unnatural angle. With his face lit from below by a holographic display, he was using to explain something to the captain. He looked demonic in the dim light of the planning room. At last, the captain nodded in agreement and came over to where Xenia was standing, by then studying a hologram she had set up to show various predicted battle durations to determine what factors were most likely to lead to a shorter navy battle. Milady Xenia, the captain said as he approached. Admiral Chell, she acknowledged with a bow of her head. We have finalised our insertion vectors and battle line, he told her. Ah, excellent, she said, with a slight smile of excitement at the coming action, tinged with apprehension at the very obvious and very real danger. Would you like to see them? Xenia nodded. She had been given a classical education, as befitting a young lady of quality, which included the strategy and tactics of warfare. Her life had gotten complicated after that, of course, and her status until recently as an outcast from her noble family had meant she had gained little practical experience of fleet actions. She keenly felt this gap in her experience, and she was looking forward to starting to fill this lack in her skill set. Proceed, Admiral. I would be very interested in seeing your preparations for taking the planet. Yes, milady. The Admiral smiled. But remember, when you look at these projections that, up to this point, everything is still theoretical, still nice and clean and logical. It only starts to get messy after contact with the enemy. Xenia smiled. She hadn't been involved in the planning of any naval battles before, but she had been in a lot of combat, assorted other adventures and close scrapes, enough to instinctively appreciate the truth of what he was saying. The Admiral saved Xenia's hologram and replaced it with one showing the objective planet and the orbital space around it. For some reason, Xenia's eyes were drawn to a data label attached to the planet by a thin, ghostly line. It had the planet's name, Pagarata, and a summary of some geographic and socio-economic features. The label blinked and disappeared, as the Admiral switched the data overlay from general to tactical, and a new label appeared where, instead of Pagarata, the planet was simply named Objective accompanied by a listing of intelligence on likely planetary defences. We will decelerate from FTL travel here, the Admiral said, pointing at a zone of orbital space which started to helpfully blink, to allow it to be more easily picked out from among the clutter of the display. Why there? Xenia asked. Well, milady, the Admiral said, his smile fading and his face becoming deadly serious as he got down to explaining his business. I've just endured a lecture from our senior tactical officer, Lieutenant Paramore, where he listed about a thousand good reasons, but they all boiled down to just one thing. What is that, Admiral Chell? Xenia asked. The zone we've chosen is on the other side of the planet from this space station here. He pointed at the hologram again, and one of the orbital units displayed there as a red diamond started blinking. Most of the enemy units, a frighteningly numerous swarm of dots, squares and other shapes, were coloured various shades of orange, but this diamond was blood crimson. Red means the highest threat level. In this kind of tactical display, 
Zenya said, suddenly remembering this nugget of information from her studies years ago. Exactly, milady, the admiral said, and she detected a note of respect in his voice. He was obviously pleased that his superior was genuinely interested in what was happening, and even somewhat knowledgeable about the basics. It's the highest threat level of anything that we suspect might be in the system. The Tarazet Deep Space Navy has even more powerful units on its roster, of course, but we don't think any of them are anywhere near this area of space. Zenya nodded. We're confident we know what its position will be, the Admiral said. It costs a lot of money to move it, and the Empire is parsimonious with expenses. So we are coming in on the other side of the planet, because the last thing we want to be doing is trying to marshal our ships into battle formation under the guns of that brute. Thank you, Admiral, Zenya said. This is fascinating. If you have time, I would like to hear more. Zenya and Admiral Chell were still on the bridge of the flagship, still discussing tactics, when the communications officer told her a communication request was coming from the spiritual leader of their rebellion, the Roundhead. Zenya simply nodded her head, and the communications officer said the link would be established in a few seconds. I will leave you to talk to the Roundhead in private, the Admiral said. No, stay, Admiral, Zenya told him. This fleet is at your command, Lady Zenya, the Admiral said. Yes, yes, of course, the young woman said distractedly. It is my birthright, but I will likely need your expertise. My birthright. You know, the Navy didn't used to be organised this way, Admiral Chell. What way? he asked. The Navy didn't used to be cobbled together from different squadrons and flights of ships, all under the command of different nobles like my father, all vying for favour with the Emperor. It used to be one cohesive professional force, with officers who applied for the honour of serving chosen on merit. That must have been a long time ago, milady, the Admiral said. The galaxy was different back then. The Star Empire itself was different. The Navy was stronger, Zenya said. We are strong now, milady, the Admiral replied. Or at least, the Tarazet Deep Space Navy was strong, until it was pulled apart by rebellion. At last, a hologram of the Roundhead started to brighten into existence. Both Zenya and Chell bowed. Stop that foolishness, the both of you, the Roundhead said, and quickly glanced round the bridge of the flagship. Impressive, Zenya. Your father's fleet is very impressive. Seeing this huge chunk of military hardware makes me feel confident of our chances of taking this planet. Chell and Zenya started to present their plans for taking the planet, which the Roundhead listened to impassively. She didn't ask any questions, content to simply follow the conversation, the bridge's lights shifting across her dome-like headgear as she moved her head to look first at the Admiral, then Zenya, then back. Actually, Zenya said, forget all this detail. The only thing that matters is that we must take our symbolic eleventh planet. We simply must. That is the only way for this rebellion to become an indelible part of history. Without this eleventh planet and others to follow, we will remain a footnote. The habitat, Valman's Market, has recently come over to the rebellion, the Admiral reminded her. We have eleven worlds. It must be planets, Zenya said, not a habitat, a space station, an asteroid or a moon. Only planets count for this calculation. It is not about real power, it's about appearances. It's about generating trust and belief in the common people who want to join us. They have to know we won't be wiped out in a year or two like so many before. Yes, milady, the Admiral conceded. A planet it must be. But this particular one will be a tough nut to crack. That's what makes it perfect, Zenya said. When we take this, when we wrestle it from the claws of the Empire... None will doubt our ability to endure, to grow, and to create a new Tarazet. New Tarazet, the Admiral repeated. New Tarazet, the Roundhead said approvingly. Much later, Admiral Chell was now alone on the bridge, apart from one robot and one other human member of the crew. The bridge was buried at the centre of the spaceship, 
which made a lot of sense from the point of protecting the valuable bridge crew, but he preferred a bridge that was projected from the ship, a bridge that allowed him to gaze at the stars through panels of transparent armour. He wanted to see the system that they had chosen for their target with his own eyes as they jumped in. Instead, he was gazing at a hologram projection of the planet with important strategic points highlighted and guesses sketched in about the possible strength of its defending forces, and they were prodigious. That was one of the strategic strengths of the plan, in the Admiral's opinion. Such a well-defended planet had been chosen that the Tarazet Star Empire were unlikely to be expecting them. It was just at the edge of what their strategic simulations said they could take, and more importantly, hold. The other human officer cleared his throat to catch the Admiral's attention. Lady Xenia is approaching the bridge, Admiral. She will be here in a moment. Chell nodded, and his eyes went back to the planet, sitting at the centre of a diffuse cloud of military units in orbit, and spread throughout the system. The bridge doors opened as he was zooming in on the atmosphere of the planet above a continental mass that was judged likely to be less inhabited than other areas. "'You're up late, milady,' the Admiral said. "'I don't sleep, Admiral,' she replied. "'I don't get tired.' "'Okay.' the Admiral said, not quite sure if this was a joke or not. He'd noticed that Xenia had under her skin some quite extensive cybernetic modification, and it wasn't beyond the bounds of reason that she might have had her system altered so that it could do without sleep entirely. Okay, milady, Xenia said, imitating his nonplussed voice, as a way of reminding him not to drop the honorific title that was her birthright. Okay, milady, the admiral corrected himself. Though I didn't think you believed in the birthrights of nobility, such as honours and titles. It's the system we have, admiral, she said simply, though change will come. I thought our insertion point was set, along with our strategy and tactics. Tell me, what are you still thinking about now? A link in the chain, the admiral replied. The chain? Yes the Admiral said. Taking a planet is a long chain of actions. The first link in that chain is that we must arrive in the system and amass our forces. Yes, as we decided, we'll jump into orbit around the planet and form the fleet up as the battle commences, Xenia said. Yes, that's the strategy we have decided on, the Admiral said pensively. We will join the battle immediately but this is a very well-defended planet. While we contest orbital space, we should also set up an in-system base, here among the asteroids, way out by the Oort cloud, and support our attacks from there. I see, Xenia said, taking this on board. And that's just the first link in the chain, the Admiral continued. Then we have to consolidate our presence in orbit. I like to have orbital superiority over an entire hemisphere of a world before I will even consider sending down atmospheric units, dropships and fighters and the like. It is indeed more complex than I had imagined, Xenia said. Then we have to establish a land base from where we can mass our surface forces and start the taking of the planet itself. No planet can be taken exclusively by space forces. You have to have boots on the ground. That's been true since war was invented. I don't think they had spaceships when war was invented, Xenia said. Then she pointed at the giant chronometer that dominated the bridge. I've been concentrating on this point, the start of hostilities. I never thought to ask how long the battle for the planet might take. How long will it be before we can declare the planet for the rebellion? Traditionally, the Admiral said, Enemy land forces have to be reduced to less than 10% of their original estimated numbers. And of course, reinforcements must be prevented. Only then can you declare the planet yours, milady. I only ask because the sooner we have our 11th planet, the more secure this rebellion will be, Xenia said. It would be very useful to have some kind of estimate for when the planet will be ours. It depends on a lot of things, the Admiral told her. If the powers are with us, 
if we decelerate from FTL to find that our insertion point was well chosen, if we win a decisive victory against their space units, then if we manage to deliver a majority of our dropships unharmed, and if we fight a lightning ground campaign from numerous drop zones, and lastly, if the Tarazet Deep Space Navy does not reinforce the defenders to its utmost capacity, it could be done as quickly as two weeks, assuming the defenders go over to our side in the numbers we are predicting. And if the powers are not on our side, and the battle drags on? Months, milady, the Admiral said emphatically. That's not acceptable, Xenia said. We need to take the planet as quickly as we can. We have to do our utmost. As you command, milady, the Admiral bowed, though there was nothing he could really do to make sure of the short campaign his lady desired. We arrive in a few hours. If you want to get any sleep at all, you should get some now. Things will start to move very fast when we decelerate from FTL travel, milady. Xenia and the Admiral were standing side by side both watching a large hologram projected onto one of the blank walls of the bridge. The hologram painted a big window there and populated it with views from video sensors on the hull, combining them to create a view of space in front of the flagship. Holograms on the side walls, ceiling and back wall did the same to create the impression that the bridge was contained in a dome that allowed an unhindered view of space around them. There wasn't much to see yet, because they were still travelling faster than the speed of light. There was a small patch of stars vanishingly far ahead of them, and a slightly larger patch of densely packed stars far behind. Every few seconds, a single star, or more rarely, two or three, would break away from the pack up ahead and come arcing over them to join the patch behind them. At last, one of the stars up ahead broke free, but didn't come shooting toward them. It came speeding directly at them, but slowing all the time, as if travelling through molasses. It grew ever so slightly, then seemed to spit out a dark orb, which now came hurtling at them until it filled the forward-viewing hologram, then finally ground to a halt. They had arrived at Pagarata. Incoming fire! somebody yelled from the other side of the bridge. Shields holding! came a shouted reply, and the tactical holograms around them went from a virtually frozen state to furious cascades of motion as they adjusted the best guesses about the defending forces that had been made updating these guesstimates with the actual information from their fleet's sensors. Almost everyone's eyes went to the tactical holograms, trying to keep up with the influx of information, trying to work out what was going on. Everyone's except Xenia's. Her eyes were fixed on the forward hologram display, which was showing the horizon of the planet, shining in the light from the system's star. She saw something there, her unnaturally acute eyes honing in on what looked like a small bump. It was almost like a mountain ranging from the atmosphere, but that was an optical illusion. The tactical hologram told her, labelling the object as orbital and appending a crimson diamond. The space station, she gasped. Yes, Admiral Chell hissed. Closer than we thought, but not close enough to catch us with direct fire weapons, thank the powers. They can launch fighters, drones, missiles, you name it, but they can't shoot at us. Thank the powers for that, Xenia said, still surprised at the sheer size of the thing. On the giant space station in orbit around Pagarata, a structure that was an unmistakable declaration of the planet's importance to the imperial economy, Commander Gatine was in her office, away from her flagship, when the first rebel spaceships started dropping out of FTL travel. One moment she had been at her desk, attending to the day-to-day -day paperwork of being in charge of the defence of a planet, and the next she was surrounded by sound and light. An alarm sounded, tactical holograms blossomed around her, and the hologram of a spreadsheet that she had been fiddling with folded itself away and faded out of existence. For a second, Gatine didn't realise what she was looking at. 
They trained to fight buzzers, and so she was used to seeing simulations of their rounded, organic space naval architecture. But the ships appearing in her tactical holograms looked similar to hers. Long silver spears, with engines at the back and a sprinkling of gun turrets along the hull. They were human. Xenia glanced around the bridge and saw a command station that wasn't in use. She went over to it and activated its hologram projector. She pulled up a view of the planet's horizon and zoomed in on the space station. Around her, voices were raised, one group of officers coordinating the deployment of the fleet, while another engaged nearby enemy units with the weapon systems of the flagship and deployed its shields to defend against return fire. In the middle of it all was the Admiral, interacting between both groups and with holograms of officers on other ships, usually the captains, that faded in and out, appearing and disappearing in front of him. Zenu was aware of all this activity and also aware that the ship had taken a couple of bad hits, enemy fire that had penetrated the shields already and dug craters in their armour but she was only aware of it on a superficial level of her consciousness. Most of her attention was on the image of the space station that she had zoomed in on until it filled the large hologram screen in front of her. The thing looked like a mountain from close up as well, or perhaps more like an iceberg. It had a fat base pointed down at the planet, and an enormous selection of more slender structures pointed away from it that all clustered round a central pyramid. Her hologram told her that the space station was launching units, pointing out launch tubes, missile batteries, launch bays, landing pads, and a myriad of other fixtures and systems, all launching hostile units or ordnance at them. At the extreme range the visuals were showing, Xenia couldn't see any of it, just a huge inert mass, squat and powerful and threatening. Xenia felt like she had been on the bridge for days, constantly something happening, constantly a crisis, constantly moments of triumph as objectives were reached or disaster was averted. The front view screen of the Dreadnought was filled with activity, the spaceships bunched unnaturally tight together in the orbital engagement much closer together than would be the case for a deep space battle. She saw a large ship, a frigate perhaps, pirouetting in front of them, seemingly outlined in fire. It was a ship called the Sabretooth, and it was designed for close-in battles like this. The reason it was right in front of them, the reason it was bathed in fire, was that it was taking incoming mass driver rounds from a nearby enemy battleship that were intended for the flagship. The reason it was pirouetting was that it was slowly turning its chewed-up armour away from the attack to present fresh, undamaged armour instead. And then the attacks stopped coming. Did we take out that battleship? Xenia asked. No, milady, the admiral said. But we now have a couple of shield ships interposed between us and them, turning those mass driver rods away. Sabretooth can stop defending us now and join in the kill flotilla I'm sending after it. Excellent, Xenia nodded. Yes, the Admiral nodded. It's gratifying to be taking the fight to that battleship, but we can't become distracted from building the next link in the chain. Our real priority is to get our carriers moved into this zone here and see if we can keep them there and give them enough cover to actually open their dropship bays. Chapter 4 The planet was above the galaxy dog, giving them a wonderful vista in their main hexagonal screen. It was filled with a view of the megastorm at the planet's south pole. The bridge was darkened, and the light of the view screens conjured long shadows from the two figures standing in the centre of the bridge, considering the planet before them. They were roughly the same height, a man and a woman, Nave and Altea. Nave was powerfully built, with wide shoulders but had fine features, including epicanthic folds at his eyes. Altea was also athletic, but slimmer, more regal, with her aristocratic features framed by a luxuriant afro. 
This is our 11th planet, and that makes it significant, Altea said. Nave nodded, watching the swirl of the storm. They say no rebellion ever grows bigger than ten planets, and here we are, ready to take this, our eleventh. If we can take it, Altea reminded him, if we can take it. Arrayed around the main screen were smaller screens, also hexagonal, showing details of the ongoing space battle. One screen showed a carrier, disgorging huge combat drones with smaller ships mixed in that carried their operators. Another small hexagonal screen showed a battleship, its main guns mounted on a central spire that emerged from its superstructure amidships. It was firing, they could see, from the flashes of light, as the powerful engines of its munitions boosted missiles to relativistic speeds or the sabots disintegrated that had been warped round rods of heavy mass, accelerated by electromagnetic coils, the debris from the sabots leaving a glowing streak. Another screen showed dogfighting. Another showed dropships manoeuvring above the atmosphere, looking for a descent path that wasn't impossibly dense with enemy defenders. Altea noticed Nave's eyes lingering on the dropships. Remind you of old times, she asked. It's too early for dropships. They're just target practice for hostile fighters this early in the battle. I remember all too well what it's like, he said. Waiting, suited up in power armour, surrounded by your drones, in the belly of one of those things, not knowing if the captain will find a way down to the surface to join the assault before a stray missile takes you out. Those days are gone, Nave, Altea told him. Now you must pay attention to the whole battle, to everything. I know, I know, Nave said. They were interrupted by a voice from behind them. There were three command consoles there, each with an acceleration couch and a bank of readouts and controls. In one of the seats, the one on the right, was a robot. It looked ordinary, a standard humanoid design, intended to do some light manual work, except the materials it was made of were too expensive. Such a robot would normally be a mix of hard plastics and cheap metals that soon started to accumulate dents and scratches. This droid was, it seemed, made entirely from bronze, with no scratches or dents to mar the sheen of its surface. The nearest Imperial reinforcements, at least the ones we know of, are probably arriving within five hours, the robot said, assuming they head this way at top speed the moment they hear about our attack. Thanks, Jay, Nave replied, and turned his attention to a large hologram pit that dominated the centre of the bridge. The hologram it was projecting was very complex. It was an attempt to represent the space battle raging around the planet in glowing lines, points and various icons. And that's why we're here. We uncloak and kick their ass as soon as they arrive. Can you predict a likely insertion point? Altea asked. The ship's tactical systems are working hard, but no, Jay said. Nothing with any high degree of accuracy. What is your gut telling you? Altea asked Nave. That this is all about symbolism, he said. They don't want to allow a single insurrection soldier's boot to touch the surface of that planet. This has to be a victory for them. They need it as badly as we do, both a military victory and for propaganda. OK, Altea said. Sounds reasonable. Can you factor that in, Jay? OK, he said. Ignoring the fact that this is not based on any data whatsoever, it does seem to help us choose a likely strategy for them. They are likely to emerge from hyperspace here. Or here, or just as likely over here. Altea glanced at the areas he was indicating, then something else caught her eye. An incoming call. It was just a small icon blinking among the readouts of her command console, but she couldn't take her eyes off it. It was her old life, reaching out to touch her, even hanging cloaked at the edge of a space battle that could prove pivotal to the entirety of the Tarazet Star Empire. It's Brax, she said. We have a couple of hours before we are required to play or part here. 
I need to take this call. What? Nave yelped. We are hiding here, ready to engage the first reinforcements to arrive, to protect Xenia's fleet, and you want to take a call? This is important. This is the reason we're here. Altea was ignoring him. She reached out a finger and touched a glowing icon on the communication interface to signal that she accepted the call. Almost immediately, a hologram started to form at the centre of the bridge. Unbelievable, Nave muttered. He fumed in his chair as Altea talked to her colleague, arms folded across his chest, head slightly bowed. Greetings, Lady Altea. Brax said as soon as his hologram had completely materialised. Nave was pretending not to look, but he saw that Brax was an android housed in a body designed to be close to human without being able to pass for human. His skin was too plastic. There were too few facial muscles and in his musculature too. Nave couldn't exactly put a word to it, but subtly it wasn't right more like a stylized drawing of a human body by an artist than a real flesh and blood one. Greetings, old friend, Altea replied. You are a subject of the Tarazet Star Empire, and you absolutely should not be contacting me. Any conversation with a rebel will look extremely suspicious, and if Shavir even suspects you are talking to me, it will mean the end of your career at the very least. Brax nodded his head a gesture that he had thought about all of this and was well aware of the risks. That is why we have not talked in many, many months, even though your expertise would be so useful here at Drifter Prime. But something has happened, Altea, something momentous. What Altea and Brax was saying had already caught Knave's attention, his head coming up, his arms unfolding as he listened. Something at the site, at Drifter Prime? Altea asked. A section of hieroglyphics has started shifting, very slowly, glacially slowly, but there is movement, Brax said. We are talking about carvings in inert metal here, and there are a few ways I can think of for the surface topography to be manipulated, but I have never seen anything like it. I have, Altea said and I was not expecting this, though I suppose I should have been. We saw the same movement of wall hieroglyphs at Ice Tomb. I assume you have read my research. No, Brack said. The word sharp, expressed with a surprisingly good approximation of rancor. Shavir is becoming ever more secretive. Only the most innocuous of scientific research is being shared, and there are other changes. What do you mean? Altea asked. That's not important, Brax said. Well, it is important, but what is happening at Drifter Prime is far more important. The moving hieroglyphics are amazing enough, but the subject of the text that the hieroglyphics are part of is perhaps just as important. Yes, that would follow, Altea nodded. Depending on what section of text, the section of text you were translating when you were called away to Ice Tomb, Brax said, interrupting her. I was working on numerous different... The section of text talking about the eye, Brax interrupted again. The changes are subtle, and my ability to translate it is not perfect. It is far from perfect. Have you made progress with decrypting hieroglyphs of the various drifter languages? That would be an extreme understatement, Altea said, without a hint of braggadocio. Did you say the text was connected to the eye? That's right, Brax said. The eye, without a shadow of a doubt. That much I am confident I have translated correctly. Have you told Shavir? Altea asked. Does she know about this? I report to the supreme functionary of the science ministry, Shavir herself, on a regular basis, Brax said, and you know I do not like to lie. I know you are very comfortable with lies of omission, Altea prompted. I could hardly omit from my report that we have seen spontaneous hieroglyphic movement, but luckily, the fact that this effect was observed in a section of text relating to the eye did not come up. 
and Shavir is distracted by the election, thankfully, Altia said. On Brig, the endless desert sands were moving. It wasn't a sandstorm. It was a combination of thousands of dust devils. The planet was prone to the formation of powerful little whirlwinds, ranging from 10 to 50 feet in diameter. They were usually harmless, but they could, on rare occasions, grow large enough to pose a threat to people and vehicles. The dust devils picked up sand from the dunes and sent it twirling into the air, later to rain down again as the winds started to subside. The sand rained down on the local plant life, hardly desert succulents, and the insect-like creatures that called the planet home, ranging from tiny pests to huge herbivores and the apex predators that thinned their herds. Atop a high cliff that rose from this desert landscape like a wall was the alien structure the rebels called their base. It was a maze of architecture covering about a square mile which looked like it had been carved from metal or perhaps assembled from unaccountable hexagonal metal components. At the centre of this base stood the lab of the Roundhead, the woman who was rapidly becoming the rebel's spiritual leader. Within the lab, among the silence of the Roundhead's experiments, there was a chime, an incoming communication hologram which the Roundhead accepted with a gesture. Two figures suddenly appeared, insubstantial and fluttering with the distance the information was travelling over the FTL communication system. Both were dressed in dark bronze, both with a heavy hexagonal bronze badge on their chests. Roundhead, the one on the right called out, a muscular man with epicanthic folds to his eyes. Yes, Knave, the Roundhead said, turning from her experiments to regard him. Knave knew the roundhead well, but he still felt a certain thrill of awe at being in her presence. She was wearing robes spun from the same super-advanced bronze fabric that he was wearing, but hers seemed more impressive somehow. The hexagon motif that covered the fabric was more intricate. He could even swear the pattern was shifting and rearranging subtly. As always, she was also wearing her strange headgear, a semi-transparent dome of technology that covered her face down to her upper lip like a mask. It was this that gave her her name. Roundhead, the other figure, a regal woman with her hair in an afro, said, I have received an important message. Who from, Altia? the woman asked. From a former colleague of mine, Altia replied. His name is Brax, a fellow researcher into the secrets of the drifters. And how is this important? I have talked with Zinya and her admiral. They tell me that the battle has been joined and you will be instrumental in winning it. Surely that is more important than any message from an old scientist friend could be. That's just the thing, Knave said. She's changed her mind. This Brax guy rings and suddenly she wants to leave Zinya and her fleet in the lurch. He's not just an old scientist friend, Altia said. He is the leader of research at Drifter Prime, which is the largest trove of Drifter technology in the galaxy that we know of. He told me something that makes me suspect the eye is opening. I guess that sounds kind of ominous, Knave said. And sure, we need to look into it. But we can't go now. We need to handle the first wave of reinforcements for Xenia. She and Admiral Chell are counting on us. What is the eye? Roundhead asked, ignoring Knave. The eye is a mechanism at the very heart of Drifter Prime, Altia said. Its purpose can only be guessed at, of course. But the texts that relate to it say that it is used to bring order to a galaxy, allowing it to be governed. The eye opening could be interpreted as this device, which according to one translation at least, can be used to rule a galaxy, is coming online. The Empire cannot be allowed to control such a device, Roundhead said. But, Knave said, the Rebellion is building momentum. We're about to try and take our 11th planet. How can we leave, chasing vague prophecies right now? It isn't a prophecy, Altia said. Enough. You want to know if the Rebellion needs you, Altia, Roundhead said. You want to know if we will survive without you. 
when you go to this Brex to see what the opening of the eye presages. Exactly, Altia nodded. We have not been able to decide what to do for ourselves. There have been differences of opinion. I say go. We have to survive without you, Roundhead said, as if stating a simple fact. But our spaceship, Galaxy Dog, Nave started to say. Roundhead interrupted, finishing his sentence for him. Is the most powerful artifact in this quadrant of space, perhaps the entire galaxy. Nave nodded, glad that Roundhead understood. It is a battle winner, and is all that has kept this rebellion from being snuffed out already on numerous occasions. It is needed in this battle, it is a battle winner. And who built the galaxy dog? Roundhead asked. The drifters, Nave answered. It's more complicated than that, Altia said. I suspect it was spun from a design in the drifter databanks by machines built by drifters, but it's new, dating from a time after the devolution of the drifters. The design is ancient, however, so it was designed by the drifters rather than built by them. I suspect the design predates the founding of the first Tarazet Star Empire by something approaching half a million years. Wild, huh? Nave said with a grin. And if Brex has found anything on Drifter Prime of comparable power, or if there is even a chance he might have, we cannot allow it to fall into the Empire's hands, Roundhead said, half turning back to her work, a subtle signal that the audience was coming to a close. I guess, Nave said. Go with Altea, Nave, the Roundhead continued. If this rebellion is to survive, it has to be able to take planets without having Galaxy Dog there to support us. Wise counsel, Roundhead, Altea said. Ah, uh, you're just saying that because she agreed with you, Knave complained. No, that's not why, Knave, Altea told him. It's because she understands the potential within Drifter technology. It's better than human gear, Knave nodded in agreement. It kicks ass. No, Altea shook her head. The things the drifters could do were like magic. Their works can be a blessing that makes anything possible, or a curse that will... that will... Altea was lost for words for a moment, searching for some way to convey how dangerous drifter technology could be. And then a fragment of a poem came back to her. A poem told to children to frighten them. It is a curse to melt the bones and blight the land. And you want to leave our friends in the rebellion in the lurch to chase it, Knave said. I have to, she told him, and you have to come with me. It is decided, Roundhead said, turning her back on them completely now, as she turned her attention back to the huge data crystal she was working on. It hung in the centre of the room on gravitic motors, and the illumination at its core pulsed brighter and dimmer. When do you go? Now. Altea said to Roundhead's back, a dark silhouette rimmed in coruscating light. Xenia's hologram appeared in the observation room, where Altea, Nave and Jay were waiting to receive her. All three standing, all three tense. Xenia nodded to them, then looked round. It was the first time that Xenia had seen the interior of the spaceship that people talked of in hushed tones the most powerful ship in the galaxy, the rebellion's prized possession, an artifact from a long-dead civilization, the drifter ship Galaxy Dog. It was not what she had been imagining. She was familiar with drifter architecture. The main base of the rebellion was housed within a sprawling outpost of that very same drifter architecture, but the room she was in, or at least her hologram was in, had been extensively modified for human habitation. The two doorways had shrunk down to human size and were now sealed with doors. There was a huge window onto space along one side of the room, but it was not hexagonal. She could see how it had been made by enlarging and merging hexagons by its irregular shape, but it was now more rectangular, more human. The seating too, normally just vague shapes extruded from the floor, had been made more cushioned, with armrests added. Whoever had been redecorating, morphing the basic drifter substrate to suit their tastes, 
had an admirable control over the alien technology. That much was obvious. The one thing they couldn't change was the colour scheme, the characteristic metallic shades of dark chestnut and almond that all Drifter technology shared. We have bad news, Nave said. Xenia's hologram, the light of which was also tinted in the same ubiquitous mix of bronze, umber and ochre as the rest of the ship, nodded. I have talked with Roundhead. She tells me that there is an urgent mission. Yes, Altea said. It is absolutely unavoidable. Xenia nodded again. But the Galaxy Dog is a fast ship, Jay added. We may be able to travel on our journey and return in time to be of some future assistance in this battle. I hope not, Xenia said grimly. This battle can't be allowed to drag on into a long campaign. We need a swift, decisive victory, and the sooner it comes, the better. My fervent hope is that the Rebellion will have its eleventh planet well before you have completed your mission. By the powers, Knave growled. That's the spirit. Our thoughts and hopes are with you, Altea said. May the powers grant you a swift journey, Xenia replied. I must drop the communication now. The battle rages around me, and it is hard fought. The amber hologram gently faded, leaving Altea, Nave and Jay alone in the observation room. They were still in system, still cloaked, lurking in ambush, but now their trap would never be sprung. They would be leaving. Jay went to the large window and stared out into space. The flashes of the engagement taking place all around them reflected in his bronze face. Look at that carnage. What a waste, he said. Altea didn't look, her eyes resolutely fixed on the floor. She had watched the battle develop and didn't need to see any more. A scene of horror, she said. Nave went to stand beside her, his hand resting on her upper arm, but his eyes were on the scene through the window and he was unable to drag them away. He saw the three fleet carriers descending to the optimum orbit to release dropships. One of the giant vessels was attempting to descend a little lower than the other two. The huge ship was just a speck from the distance they were viewing it from, and its progress looked serene. But Nave knew it was struggling forward in the teeth of fierce resistance. Jay raised a hand and his metal fingers stroked at the window, creating a hologram subwindow with a magnified view of the lead carrier. Suddenly, the ferocity of the fighting became apparent. The carrier had enormously strong shields, generated by machines the size of huge buildings, and shield barges swarmed round it, basically just shield generators with engines and armour attached, that augmented the carrier's own defences. But still, some of the incoming fire was getting through. A constant hail of damage that would eventually spell the doom of even a ship as robust as a carrier. Nave saw armour being atomized and shed in fountains of fragments. It looked bad, but he knew the armour was actually ablative, designed to fragment and shatter, to rob incoming fire of its destructive force. The actual damage being done wasn't as bad as it looked, despite the cratering, scorching, gouging and clouds of debris. Then he saw an explosion of liquid metal, melted and seemingly spat out into space as a huge charge of destructive energy hit home. Powers, he cursed. That was structure, not armour. They're taking a pounding. As each strike hit home, the damage was accompanied in the window Jay had drawn by a blossom of text. What is that text? Nave asked. Altea looked up and squinted a second before replying. It is the ship's computer, making its best guess about where each shot that causes damage came from. Oh really, Nave said, and pointed at the display. The worst damage usually has this little bunch of symbols. What do they mean? The meaning, Altea said, is something like, uh, it's difficult to translate without a little more context, but, but something like, Ground living cannon? What the powers is a ground living cannon? Nave asked, suppressing an urge to scratch his head in confusion. Wait, I know, it must be a space howitzer, Jay told him, 
sweeping his hand again to create a window showing a bird's eye view of the planet's surface. He swiped left and right, moving the view around and pinched and spread his metal fingers to zoom. It has to be somewhere around here. They could see four huge vehicles surrounding a central vehicle that was larger still. That thing in the middle, that's the howitzer, and these four big tanks surrounding it are shield generators. How about, Nave said, a wicked grin spreading across his face. We give Xenia a parting gift. You mean, Altia said, raising her eyes at last, but not to the window. She raised her eyes to gaze into those of Nave. Yeah, he nodded. We take out that space howitzer for them, Jay said, completing the sentence Altia had started. The surface of Pagarata was hard and rocky, except where it had been pulverized to form a loam for crop growing. At the border between some of these artificial fields and a wide expanse of the natural bare rock of the planet was where the space howitzer had been set up. It was surrounded by four towering slab-like vehicles that were projecting powerful interlocking shields to protect it. The howitzer itself was a comparatively delicate piece of machinery. It was mounted in a grav chassis, with the gravitic switched off, leaving the structure resting in the bedrock below, as were the four shield projectors. In fact, the vehicles weren't just resting on the ground. The space howitzer was dug securely into the rock to give a very firm firing base, and it needed it. The central component of the central structure was the gun barrel, pointing directly up and supported by gargantuan struts and buttresses. Rounds were loaded in the bottom by a crew of very crude robots, drones with intelligences far below the threshold for AI, spread out into a daisy chain and commanded by a human operator sitting in a command jeep nearby. The drone furthest from the howitzer, a giant beast with mighty actuators, picked up a massive round the size of a public transport maglev carriage and passed it on to the next drone in line. The round was then passed from hand to hand and the drone positioned at the base of the barrel slid it into place. The gun then fired, a huge chemical explosion that sent billowing clouds of gas and flame scooting out of vents arrayed at the base of the barrel. The round exploded upward and was caught by the magnetic coils of a gorse gun, accelerating the round to even faster speed. The round then left the barrel, with the sound like a sledgehammer being pounded against a sheet of steel. A huge laser mounted alongside the barrel then fired upwards, kicking even more energy into the round, boosting it upward at even faster speeds until it exploded out of the atmosphere like an asteroid in reverse. The whole procedure took 20 seconds from start to finish and was a hypnotic display of raw destructive power. As the rounds were being fired upwards, the orbiting spaceships that were under attack were replying with flechettes dropped directly from space. The Earth round the space howitzer was scorched by the hot gases it belched out but it was also covered in flechettes, sticking out of the ground like a forest of javelins, right up to the edge of the shields. And then the drifter ship appeared out of nowhere, already on a strafing run toward the howitzer. The ship just shimmered into existence, the shadow below it appearing a few seconds later. It came speeding through the air, as architectural as a spire, combined with the arch of a bridge bronze and malevolent. Its main armament was a pair of energy cannon mounted in its chin, and they unleashed bolts of such force it almost seemed they ripped the atmosphere apart. Sheets of discharge were created, along with lightning balls and jagged spikes of ionized air and electricity, like a lightning storm unleashed from the nozzle of a fire hose. The four shields withstood the onslaught for a while, glowing with each hit. First, the shields glowed, 
But then one of the shield's generators started to glow. Its heat sinks colored an intense cherry red as it tried to deal with a load of damaging energy it was being asked to absorb and dissipate. At last, inevitably, it failed in a catastrophic event that was half eruption, half explosion, producing flying debris and rivulets of liquid metal. Down to only three generators, inevitably, the other shields failed, and the massive, streaking bolts of energy tore into the delicate machinery of the unarmored and now unshielded howitzer. The whole thing somersaulted in the air and burst apart like an overripe fruit as the drone that had been feeding in a charge was vaporized. The drifter ship flew through an expanding fireball of destruction and then its flight path curved upwards as it started to climb back up out of the planet's atmosphere and gravity well. Xenia and Admiral Chell watched the drifter ship carry out the attack on the space howitzer, standing together, watching pictures in a hologram pit. Fantastic, the Admiral said. It boggles the mind to watch such a powerful spaceship in action. I don't have a single other unit that would be capable of getting to the edge of the atmosphere undetected, and they just swooped down to the planet's surface without anyone having a clue they were even there until it was too late. Can you imagine a fleet of ships like that? They have to go, Admiral, Xenia told him. We're on our own now. I guess taking out the space howitzer is just their way of saying goodbye. I'll update our tactical predictions accordingly, the Admiral said. Right now, we have no time to mourn their departure. We have to get those carriers into position. We have to establish a power base, like they have with that damn space station. We need to establish ourselves our own impregnable fortress. Xenia nodded, her gaze on the tactical hologram now showing a view of the Imperial Space Station, the iceberg that might sink her attempt to take the planet. The enemy could run to whatever they wanted. Any ship that had been damaged, or had its ammunition depleted, could run off to the space station and be refueled, given ammo, and have damage repaired. The Admiral was absolutely right. Something would have to be done about it. Chapter 5 Galaxy Dog was arriving in the Drifter system, and it never failed to take Altea's breath away. The most obvious feature, of course, was the light sail. It had been visible for hours as she approached a unique landmark within the galaxy. The sail was an enormous, self-supporting artificial construct, the product of megascale astro-engineering. It was positioned next to the star at a position chosen by its architects to balance gravitational attraction towards the star and radiation pressure away from the star. This made the radiation pressure of the star asymmetrical and this created thrust. The star was essentially tethered to the sail, being pulled along on its own solar wind. The thrust and acceleration was very slight but the star's fuel was enough for billions of years. Drifter Prime had been travelling for a very long time indeed. That wasn't all, though. There was an entirely artificial planet in orbit, which had been dragged along by its parent star, constructed to be carried through the galaxy forever, or even journey between galaxies. The entire artificial planet could be thought of as a kind of passenger compartment in a galactic-scale vehicle, the Drifter system, but a passenger compartment that could carry billions of passengers. The planet filled the main view screen at the front of the darkened bridge, but her eyes were drawn from the view screen to her instruments. Nave was no scientist, so he just stared at the screen. He could see that the planet wasn't artificial in the sense of having a terraformed environment, which would be something that the Tarazet Star Empire was capable of. No, it was a medium-sized planet that was entirely made of metal, something the Empire definitely was not capable of. That thing is... Nave paused, 
struggling to find a word that adequately encompassed what he was seeing. Big. He looked over at Altea for confirmation, and she looked up from her instruments and raised a disapproving eyebrow. What have I told you about stating the obvious? she chided. Knave smiled disarmingly at her, his eyes wrinkling in just that way he knew always worked. The problem is, he said, it isn't always obvious what is obvious and what isn't obvious, at least not to me. She shook her head in mock disapproval, and her attention turned back to her work again, just as Jay walked onto the bridge. You're not going to believe this, the robot said, but I'm pretty sure the local defence fleet has spotted us. No way, Knave said. That was not part of the plan. How is that even possible? Aren't our stealth systems too advanced for human technology to penetrate? Usually, yes, Jay nodded his bronze head. He directed the main screen to change from displaying the artificial planet to instead show a close-up of just one of the Imperial dreadnoughts in the system. They could see its manoeuvring thrusters flaring and its giant rear thrusters burning a brighter blue as it shifted position. The hologram pit at the centre of the bridge also sprung into life, showing the deployment of the planet's defenders in a three-dimensional schematic. They could all see that the local fleet formation was slowly changing. So, Jay continued, I guess we are going to have to jump to FTL and get out of here. Yes, Nave nodded in agreement. We need to get back to the battle for the 11th plan. No, Altia interrupted him, her voice firm. We cannot abandon this mission. It will be more difficult now, but not impossible. Commander Virim was gazing at the display of the tactical hologram at the centre of her command bridge. It was showing what the fleet's distributed sensors and science instruments were picking up, and it was impressive, but not in a good way. Her fleet was one of the most technologically advanced to be deployed anywhere across the entire Tarazet Star Empire and it certainly had the deepest integration with science vehicles and their equipment. The sensor suite at her disposal could locate and image even the small rocks and pebbles that were strewn through any planetary system. Anything as large as a spaceship, no matter how well cloaked, had no chance of hiding from her. Yet her tactical hologram was not able to render the enemy ship. Her team had worked miracles to even find it, but now, even though they knew where it was, it was proving impossible to build a good picture of it. All she could see was a shifting mess of panels and shapes as the tactical computers tried to work out exactly what the enemy's configuration was. And then, the cloaks fell, revealing the sleek alien spaceship in sharp detail. They've dropped their cloaking! One of the bridge crew, a man standing with his arm at the rim of the pit, to her left, said to her, They probably don't want us scanning their shields too deeply for too long and working out its secrets. Okay, now we can see it. Can you tell me it's heading? The commander asked. Yes, a bridge officer replied. As we guessed, they're moving toward the artificial planet Drifter Prime, and they're speeding up. They're not trying to escape. Virim whispered, shaking her head at the manoeuvre. In the face of her entire fleet, here to protect and study the planet, the ship wasn't even wavering in their course, despite discovery. If it was any other spaceship, the idea of doing anything except trying to escape would be suicide. But this wasn't any other spaceship. It was the Drifter ship, a hideously powerful artefact that had been unearthed by the Tarazet Star System's most gifted scientist, before she went rogue. It is magnificent and fearsome, her second-in-command said, echoing her own thoughts. There are precious few ships that can stand against it. Both human and buzzer fleets have tried to capture it, tried and failed. We are no ordinary system defence fleet, Virim reminded the woman. We have studied the drifter ship. We can take it. Imagine what a prize that would be for the new emperor or empress. Position the capture ships and open up with the big guns, 
Virim bellowed, then added more softly, What I wouldn't give for a swift destroyer or two. Jay groaned in annoyance, laced with fear. The drifter ship had suddenly become the target of just about every big gun the system defense fleet possessed. The biggest of them were on the Dreadnought, which had five turrets, each with six guns. The muzzles of the weapons were wide, the barrels were long, and the electromagnetic coils within them were capable of hurling huge chunks of metal at relativistic speed. The Dreadnought was also accompanied by four smaller ships that were called energy barges. They were each armed with a single energy cannon mounted on an eyeball mount that protruded from the undersides of the ships like pot bellies. While the Dreadnought attacked with brute physical power, the energy barges were projecting a small amount of destructive potential, but using beams of force instead. The range of this combat wasn't long by the standards of space battles, but it could still be measured in astronomical units, which meant firing directly at the enemy was pointless. The target would almost certainly have simply moved away before any slugs or beams hit home. Instead, Virim's ships loosed off patterns of fire, determined by the predictions of their tactical computers. Each salvo was designed to pepper a likely area of space with shots in the hopes of scoring a hit. Before her first salvo was even halfway to the enemy, Virim saw telltale muzzle flashes across the surface of its hull, indicating it was returning fire. Mostly energy projectors and missiles, her second in command said. We know they have mass projectors, but they're not using them. Not yet, Virim growled. Even they can't have an unlimited supply of heavy metal for the gauze guns. They'll be saving it. They're targeting the capture ships, the second-in-command said, confused. How could they possibly know our plan? Altea, Virim muttered. She's the preeminent mind in the galaxy, apart from Shavia. It's hard to fool her, but even if she has guessed our plan, that doesn't mean it will still not work. Jay was now sitting in his command chair the one on the right of the cluster of three command chairs, while Altea and Nave moved toward the bridge exit. Are you sure you want to take out these little ones? Jay asked. If you want to get out of the system, Altea told him, then yes, you should absolutely destroy those small ships. They are warping and twisting hyperspace. You won't be able to jump to FTL travel within a half of an astronomical unit of one of them. Understood the robot said. Good luck down there. The second in command was watching one of the capture ships disintegrating under the energy guns of the drifter ship. By the powers, she muttered. I was hoping they would be able to take more punishment than that, Virim spat. We're landing hits, her gunnery officer and his team of spotters told her. Beautiful, Virim said a hint of a smile replacing the scowl that had greeted the destruction of the capture ship. To her eyes, it was beautiful. She was watching the action in the main tactical hologram, a ballet of small red dots, very slowly jittering around as though under the influence of Brownian motion, each dot representing some huge vessel designed to project destruction but she was also watching the screens showing video feeds of her target. She watched its shields scintillate in ridges and waves of blue, like the luminescence of a deep-sea invertebrate, and saw fountains of armour being gouged by shots that penetrated the shields. A grin of enjoyment spread across her face. Just beautiful, she whispered, then bellowed more loudly. The engines! Take out the engines! The huge fighting ships were all surrounded by their own light shows now. They were all manoeuvring hard, while some were also launching missiles, drones and fighters. Some had the blue fluorescence of incoming fire illuminating their shields, and almost all were firing whatever big guns they had. It seemed like this was all directed at the artificial planet, but that was only because their real target 
was diving toward it. Their real target was the sleek drifter ship, and with so many guns on it, some of that massed fire inevitably hit home. The ship was still manoeuvring freely and unpredictably enough that it was difficult to target any one specific area of the hull, but the rear, where the engines were located, was taking more hits than the rest. Red Enter, the captain of the nearest warship to the drifter ship, a frigate named Eternal, had an excellent view of the incoming fire and the damage being caused to the alien spaceship racing in front of him. It was almost a shame, Redenta thought, to see its elegant, almost architectural arch-like shape marred by such damage. That didn't give him any pause about ordering his own ship to fire, though. Just like the rest of the fleet, they were maintaining a merciless barrage directed at the drifter ship. Calculating spread pattern, his chief gunnery officer yelled. Receiving pattern, came the acknowledgement from turret one. These same words, receiving pattern, then came from all the other turrets in turn, followed almost immediately by the words, firing, again repeated by all eight of the Eternal's turrets. Then Captain Redenta felt a shudder as massive energies were unleashed at a spread of positions their tactical cause guessed were likely future positions of their target. There was no return fire coming in reply. Their target had plenty of other targets to busy itself with, and the same tactical cores were not predicting any incoming fire from their quarry with any degree of likelihood. This should have been a huge advantage to the Eternal, but it didn't seem to be making much difference at all. The drifter ship was forced to take a jinking, jittering zigzag of a path to its undoubted target, the artificial world while the Eternal could fly with arrow straightness in pursuit. Under normal circumstances, that would see a fast ship like the Eternal speedily close with its target. But the distance between Eternal and the drifter ship was only closing slowly. It would undoubtedly reach the planet before Eternal managed to close with it, unless its engines were disabled. Yes, he heard his chief gunner officer hiss in jubilation. It was a good pattern. Two, no three hits. Calculating new pattern. The target is still inbound on the planet, one of the officers at the tactical hologram said. It's within one astronomical unit. By the very powers, Redenta muttered, it's fast. From the point of view of the drifter ship, it was now plummeting out of space falling toward the giant chunk of metal at the bottom of the gravity well that was the artificial planet, while fire rained down from behind. It was also now being intercepted by some of the fleet's very fastest missiles, fighters and drones, so all of its own weapons were now deployed and firing, keeping the fighters and drones at a distance. It was firing at the more distant, bigger ships too, from a turret on its back, Ripples of missile launches came from all down its flanks, and mass drivers were opening up from all over the ship's hull. It was a prodigious amount of fire, but nothing in comparison with what was coming the other way toward it. It was like the drifter ship was the focus of a wedge of fire as it lanced towards its target, and then it suddenly veered off in another direction. Jay glanced away from the tactical hologram at a video feed from one of the chambers within the ship. It was the chamber that held one of the pieces of technology, just one of them, that set the drifter ship apart from every other ship currently operational across the whole of human space. It was the teleportation chamber, a technology no one else had. Jay saw that both Nave and Altea had ascended the teleportation platform. He saw that Altea was reaching out and touching Nave's chest, just where he wore his armour badge, a little ritual they had just before teleportation. And then they were gone, the room suddenly empty. Good luck, Jay hissed. We're all going to need it. Captain Redenta gripped the arms of his command chair and stared at the sudden change in the tactical hologram. What's it doing? he yelled. It's abandoned its run on the planet, 
his tactical analyst said, as she squinted into the depths of the giant hologram that displayed the position of every unit in the fleet, along with their single solitary prey. They must have decided to disengage. Chase them, Redenta barked. Changing course now, the helm officer yelled in confirmation. Admiral Virim watched the drifter ship cut and run from the bridge of her flagship, and she muttered a curse under her breath. While the drifter ship had been heading for the planet, they had had precious time to degrade its shields and armour, and then hopefully take out its engines. If they were running, there wouldn't be much time left at all. Can we block their path? Virim asked. Negative, her second-in-command said with an emphatic shake of the head. They're heading for the patch of sky with the least density of our units. We won't be able to generate a field sufficient to prevent their jump to light speed. They will be gone in seconds. Let's make those seconds count, the Admiral said. They'll have to fly straighter to build momentum for a faster-than-light jump. Our guns will have less trouble hitting them. Jay felt the difference in the incoming fire as soon as he had laid in a relatively straight course to build up speed for the jump. He felt the bridge start to buck and heave below him as he glanced at a hologram of the drifter ship to his left that showed the damage being done to them. He could see it rapidly deteriorating as shot after shot penetrated the shields and cratered the hull. He was taking a terrible pounding, and there was a brace of missiles on his tail closing on him. He knew they would just disappear as soon as they had made the jump. Missiles with FTL engines were extremely rare, though not unheard of, and these were definitely not of that type. All he had to do was make the jump, and suddenly the sky would be clear. It would be a little rearranged by the relativistic speeds they would be travelling, but it would be clear. He said a silent prayer that the drifter ship would hold together long enough. Virim watched a magnified view of the space around the drifter ship and things were getting busy. The drifter ship now had to cross the lines of her fleet, allowing her ships, despite being slower than the drifter ship, a chance to intercept. The drifter ship still had its nose ahead but it was rapidly being surrounded by spaceships coming to intercept from all angles. Many of them were small, fast designs, unlikely on their own to be able to trouble the drifter ship, but one was bigger, with more powerful guns, the Eternal. The Eternal's rear thrusters were shining like stars and were surrounded by cherry-red heat vanes, trying to dump huge amounts of heat into the unfeeling fabric of space. There were more heat vanes mounted on the gun turrets, and they too were glowing, so brightly that they were dimly reflected in the scuffed armour of the Eternal. Its guns were firing constantly, zeroing in on the drifter ship as missiles started to strike home through the defences of the shields and the fire of the small mass drivers shooting them down. The Eternal's main turret was now scoring hit after hit, all concentrated on the drifter ship's aft, near the engines. Yes, yes, Virim hissed. Then, the drifter ship was gone. The missiles that had been about to impact were left without a target, and the energy beams from Eternal's main guns streaked into the dark. Virim recoiled from the tactical hologram, as if it had burned her, and took a step back. She'd almost believed that they had a chance to stop the drifter ship, to capture it. Should we pursue? one of her deck officers asked. Yes, but just one ship, the Admiral answered. This system is not an area that can be left undefended. Send the Eternal. Chapter 6 the alien scientist stared into the hologram that was spread before her. Her face was a blank mask of metal with two deep sensor pits for eyes. Her solid face was incapable of showing feelings, so she expressed her confusion with a release of pheromones from glands at the seams of her exoskeleton rather than by contorting facial muscles as a human would. 
She reached out one of her forearms and adjusted some settings on her science console, but the anomalies were still present. She had been observing activity for days now, and it was only increasing. She couldn't sit on this any longer. Incredible, she muttered, squirting the words out across various radio wavelengths. She put a call through to her most senior hive elder and waited. She took the opportunity while waiting for the call to be taken to gaze at the beauty of her lab one more time. She never tired of it. There were four walls of inert bronze and one wall of ice. Almost all of the room's light was coming from that one bluish-white wall. It was very dim light, but she had adjusted her optical sensors to compensate. Anything above complete darkness was all she needed. At last, the call she had placed was taken, and she was joined in her chamber by another creature just like her, except it was smaller, and there were data input and output nodes studded across its hide. It was a hologram, and so it glowed slightly in the darkness of the room, and there was no shadow on the ground below it, where it stood on its four chitinous legs. Project Leader! the hologram said. The High Velder cannot take this call at the mo- Tell him the eye is opening, the scientist interrupted. Tell him that what I have been predicting is starting to happen. What is the eye? Again, the scientist didn't allow the other of her kind to finish its sentence. Tell him what I have said. He will know what it means. She dismissed the connection. She had no time to waste swapping pleasantries with holographic communication technicians. The ground beneath her shook slightly, and a couple of pebble-sized fragments came away from the ice wall. Intolerable, the scientist muttered to herself. She opened another communication link, and this time she was gratified to see it answered immediately by the creature she wanted to talk to. The hologram that joined her was, again, an alien of the same type as her, but even more different in configuration. Almost all of its chitin had been replaced by silvery metals. Its claws were laser-sharp, and it was compact, with powerful muscles attached inside its exoskeleton and powerful actuators on the outside, like barnacles. Swarm Commander, the scientist said, my lab was shaken by some kind of detonation. I hope I need not remind you of how delicate my experiments are. I'm sorry you were disturbed, the swarm commander said. The human vermin have started yet another planetary assault. The tremor you felt was their bombardment, softening us up for a troop drop. They are very keen to get their fleshy little paws on ice tomb. What are their chances? The scientist asked, suddenly concerned. She was not concerned for her own safety, of course. All she cared about was the integrity of her research and experiments. It is the largest force we have yet seen them amass in this sector, the swarm commander said, seeing no reason to sugarcoat things. If I am not reinforced, we can expect them to be running around on the surface on their squishy lower appendages within weeks. That is unacceptable, the scientists replied, exuding a cloud of anger pheromones which were picked up and transmitted to the swarm commander. The last time humans penetrated to the surface, my research was put back months. I actually lost a replaceable science staff in fighting. The word was distasteful to the scientist, the idea of a creature designed for science being forced to trade blaster bolts with humans turned her stomach. That was warrior work, and the hives of the warriors were very different to the ones that had spawned her. I am a warrior, the swarm commander said, not an elder. I do not decide what resources are allocated to each action. I simply ensure that they are deployed to the best possible advantage. I can only bring victory if I am given sufficient units. I understand, the scientist said. The swarm commander was right. 
If he could have defended the surface from human bombardment, he would have. Shouting at him served no purpose. She closed the communicator and went back to her work. But his inability to protect her work kept niggling at her, kept bothering her. She would have to talk to him about it again. Three days later, the scientist travelled from the ice moon up to the swarm of buzzer ships in orbit. She could see flashes of weapons fire out in far orbits, but the atmosphere and near orbits were clear. Her shuttle docked with the swarm commander's pod ship, and within minutes she appeared in person for her audience with the swarm commander. With the ice moon under constant attack from human forces, the area was a theatre of war, where the military held authority, and therefore, for now, the swarm commander was her superior. Until their lines advanced, and Ice Tomb was put beyond the ability of the humans to easily reach, she would have to show him due deference. The shuttles used by the warriors of her species were small, with compact spaces for their compact and robust bodies. Her form, bloated as it was with embedded scientific equipment, was a poor fit. They were all buzzers. They all shared the same basic physical form, with four legs, four arms, a smooth metallic face, with two deep dark sensor pits as the only features, but they were very different, as befit their different roles. Luckily, the swarm commander's bridge was more spacious, with a large command throne embedded with hologram projectors to give him the best possible overview of any battle his flagship was involved in. He didn't bother deactivating his tactical holograms when she was shown onto the bridge, leaving veils of glowing information floating in the air between them. She saw ship positions, sheets of scrolling text, provisioning rosters, the dull but essential minutiae of a military campaign, and she noticed how it was all reflected in miniature in his metallic face, but the reflections were distorted, as if in the field of a black hole as they came near the pits of his eyes. At her side was a warrior she assumed was of a high rank, and there were two other warriors at the periphery of the room, fussing with readouts and interacting with their own tactical holograms. She ignored them, all except the swarm commander. It was his opinions that counted, nobody else's. Swarm commander, she began, thank you for seeing me. I require you to listen to something I have to say. Please proceed to tell me, science leader, the swarm commander said. Ice Tomb is a hugely important asset. That much is clear, and I assume we can both agree on it, she continued. That is the determination of the strategic hives, the swarm commander nodded. I do not expend much processing power on trying to second-guess their priorities. We can take as given that Ice Tomb is of great importance, otherwise I and my mighty forces would not have been tasked with defending it. Quite so, the scientist said momentarily glad that her thinking was not quite as linear and constrained as his. The only thing here of value is the concentration of technology left by the drifter civilization before their downfall. This is the reason we are here, and I must have peace, uninterrupted as I conduct my research. It is very delicate work. I cannot have humans bombarding the Drifter complex at Mount Fang. As I said, the swarm commander replied, I do not decide on such matters. But the units at my disposal have been increased. My swarm has been expanded and I can better protect you on the surface. The Hive Elders have heard me, the scientist told him, spraying pheromones of joy. The eye is opening, and to properly take advantage of this event requires absolute peace and quiet. Inside the artificial planet known as Drifter Prime, there were tunnels and chambers, some small, very much on a human scale, but not most of them. Most of them were much bigger. 
scaled for creatures elephantine in their dimensions to inhabit. The air in one of these giant chambers went fuzzy and thickened for a fraction of a second, and then Altea and Nave appeared at the centre of the space, Altea still touching Nave's chest. They both glanced around the room, their hands instinctively going to their sides, close to their weapons. But the room was empty, and they both soon relaxed a little. This place smells, Nave said. You soon get used to it, Altea assured him. The chambers of the planet don't have an atmosphere, so the scientists here manufacture one and pump it into the areas they are studying. There are atmosphere plants dotted all around. The air they make smells a little funky. And the architecture, Nave said. The whole thing looks more solid than I'm used to. Human architecture, spaceships and stuff, all looks bolted together. But this all looks carved from solid metal. That's one of the theories, Altea blithely told him, smiling at his astute observation. So, if there is atmosphere in here, Nave said, there will be sensors too. The guards will know we're here. There are no guards, Altea told him, at least not many of them. You saw the forces arrayed out there to stop anyone getting anywhere near the place. If it wasn't for the teleporter, even the drifter ship wouldn't have been able, Galaxy Dog, Nave said. Our spaceship's name is Galaxy Dog. Don't remind me, Altea grimaced and smiled at the same time. She would never get used to that hideous name, no matter how many times she heard it. But she got some perverse enjoyment from arguing with Nave about it. My point is, what would we need guards for here? And the fewer idiots you have walking round down here contaminating the place, the better. We, Nave said, raising an eyebrow. Force of habit, Altea said. I spent a large percentage of my life working here on this strange world. OK, Nave nodded, no guards. But I'm guessing it won't take long for the scientists to realise we're here. Not necessarily. Altea told him. The reason the air smells bad is that the technology interferes with the atmosphere machines. The sensors have the same problem. And this is a sector where the sensors were always the least reliable. That's comforting. OK, let's go find a data node, Altea said. I need to download the information Brax has left on the local network for us. Which way? Nave asked. Altea paused while she looked at their options. The chamber had one huge door on one side and two small archways on the other. The archways were completely unobstructed and the door was also open, held away from completely shutting by hydraulic rams of obvious human construction. The rams were a grey and scratched mix of cheap metals and plastics, while the door they were holding open was a massive bronze slab its surface with an oily sheen to it, as if it had been recently polished. The contrast couldn't be more obvious. It's easy to spot the human architecture against the alien metal, Nave said. Hmm, Altea nodded, then pointed down one of the two unobstructed archways. This way, she said. Altea and Nave walked side by side, unhurriedly, both looking around them at the alien surroundings. It must be strange coming back here, Nave said. In what way? Altea asked. Well, you used to run this whole place. You were the top scientist here, and now you're sneaking about like a criminal. Yes, that is strange, Altea said, a little note of annoyance in her voice. But I'm not sneaking around, or skulking or slinking. I'm here at the invitation of my former colleague Brax. Brax is a first-class mind, but he is not the authority on drifter technology that I am. Since we discovered the drifter ship, I have learned so much. He has simply been left behind. He needs me. Nave just nodded. He still wasn't sure what the opening of the eye exactly was, and Altea's explanation had left him even more confused. But there was no way he was going to let her face it alone. The scientific team on Drifter Prime was spread across the entire planet, but there was one site that was judged to be more interesting than the others. It was where efforts were focused, 
and where most scientists worked, all collaborating on studying in one single location. This area was the largest feature of the planet's surface, the rift. It was a kind of canyon that was cut two kilometers deep into the planet's mechanical crust. Attached to one side was a complex of buildings, the grey of the human architecture standing out against the bronze of the drifter architecture. From a distance, the human buildings looked like nothing more than grey fungus on the face of a bronze sculpture. Altir had made sure they teleported to a nearby location and she knew that they were now about to emerge into the rift, close enough to the encrustation of human structures to be able to see it from a distance. She was looking forward to seeing that structure again, where she had spent so much time. But then she suddenly stopped walking forward, a confused expression on her face. Did you see that? she asked. Nave walked a few steps before noticing she was no longer beside him. Then he too stopped, and he looked round. Did I see what? The shadows, Altir said. They shifted. Nave pulled a block of metal from his pocket that immediately transformed into a pistol shape and sank snugly into his palm. He glanced apprehensively all around. He wasn't sure what she meant by shifting shadows, but he knew he didn't like the sound of it. He saw shadows, plenty of them. The corridor they were walking along was as big as the arched interior of a cathedral, and the walls were an intricate interplay of supports with hexagonal buttresses reaching up into the darkness above. Even the floor wasn't entirely regular, with columns of machinery protruding from it sometimes tall enough to join the ceiling. Most of the light was coming from some small fittings of obviously human design that were attached here and there to wall and ceiling, but some was coming from a diffuse mist of very slightly luminous gas. It was a confused and fractured environment where Nave saw a lot of shadow and where the weak illumination didn't reach very far, but none of the shadows he could see were shifting. Where? he asked. Over there, Altia said, pointing to a column that protruded from the floor just a little way behind them. Nave took a couple of steps until he was standing beside Altia, and he stared at the column she had indicated. It gave him the vague impression of a tree or a cactus. Metallic roots spread out from its base in a fan, and long thin panels extended up from its sloped upper surfaces a few yards into the air above Nave's head. What is that thing? Nave asked. A scratching post for big alien monsters. Altia laughed a couple of snorts at the idea, then fell silent and stared at the object. In our research, we call them freestanding integrated units of type Y54. Altia said, pensively. We have no idea what their purpose is, beyond some wild conjecture. To be honest, your idea of a monster scratching post is no less likely than any of the ideas we scientists have come up with. I guess I was just being, what did you call it? Facetious, Altia told him. But that's not my point. Your offhand joke has as much merit as any hypothesis that a team of the best scientists of the Tarazet Star Empire developed. We know so little about this object. Nave nodded, but he didn't take his eye off the cactus column, and he still had his gun in his hand. I didn't see any shifting shadows, Nave said. I still don't. No, and there's no way I could have either, Altia told him, a little perplexed. This whole damn planet is dead. It's an inert mass. But you saw something. A trick of the light, Altia said. Nothing more. What about the opening of the eye? Nave asked. That may be causing small-scale realignments of subsystems, yes, Altia nodded. Okay, Nave said, finally returning his gun to a pocket at his side, where it transformed back to a small block of metal. They both turned round turning their backs on the cactus column, and continued down the corridor. Pogia was examining the wall of the intersection where the new corridor had burrowed through. 
Yetena was standing behind her, watching over her shoulder. What are you looking at? Yetena asked. I'm looking for any clue about what process caused this new corridor to appear, she said. I mean, it obviously wasn't created at the same time as the planet itself. I don't know, Yetena said. How do you even build a planet anyway? You can't build it like a ship in a shipyard, according to a set of blueprints that mark every corridor and chamber. Why not? Posia asked. I know it's far more likely that this planet has grown somehow. The different layers of its structure seem to point to that, but it's not impossible that it was simply assembled from prefabricated parts in a really big shipyard. That's nuts, Yatena snorted. This is a planet. How big would that make the shipyard? The size of a sun would be my guess, Posia replied, not looking round from her observations. We don't know a lot about the drifters, but I doubt even they had the technology to create a structure the size of a sun. It would collapse under its own weight. There are some limits to what can be done, you know. Like the speed of light, Posia said finally turning, just so that Yatena could see her mocking grin. Of course, the speed of light had been surpassed using FTL engines many millennia ago, but it was still the famous example scientists used to mock a superstitious fear of progress. Anyway, Posia said, turning back to her work, however this structure came about, it would be very interesting to understand how and why it has altered itself to create this new corridor. I want to know what process was used, and why we didn't detect it, Yatena added. Exactly, Posia nodded. I think we're going to need more measuring equipment. I'll go back to base and get us a deep scanner and a proper holographic display, Yatena offered. Great, and a surface scraper, Posia said, distracted again. Oh, and an analysis console. Yatena went over to the small transport, and it was only as she was getting in that she saw the two figures in grey uniforms and distinctive headgear simply standing there, watching. You can come with me, she yelled over to the man. You can help me carry the stuff. Nave and Altea were now out in the rift, approaching a structure that had obviously been created by humans and grafted to the underlying drifter structure. A science sub-base, Altea told Nave, a glorified storage area and a place to spend the night if you can't make it back to your home science station. It's probable that there are no staff present. OK, Nave nodded, absorbing the information as he took a good look at the building. Do they have soup? I could really go for soup right now. Have you been listening to what I've been saying, Nave? Altea turned her head to glare at him. Sure, of course I have, Nave replied, with what he hoped was a disarming smile. But, specifically, what exactly is it you're talking about? I'm talking about why we're here. Yeah, I know that. Your old friend Brax needs help. It's not just that, Altea growled. It is what he said when he contacted us. He said the eye was opening, a structure the size of a continent, and it is starting to initiate its operations. I swear you didn't tell me that part, Nave said, a little hurt. You didn't tell me how big it was. I would have remembered that if you told me. I told you, Altea hissed. Nave, whatever is happening here, the stakes are impossibly high. This planet is made of the same stuff as Galaxy Dog. Hey, you said its name. Nave couldn't help grinning. Galaxy Dog. It's the same stuff as the Drifter Ship, Altea corrected herself. And the only reason the Drifter Ship is a weapon that can shift the balance of power across the galaxy while this entire planet is just an archaeological site is that the metal of Galaxy Dog, Gah, the Drifter Ship, is alive while the metal of this place is dead. I get that, Nave nodded, starting to see the enormity of the situation. If the eye, an enormous area of super-advanced alien technology, comes alive, Altea carried on, and the Emperor or Empress learns how to control it, then all bets are off. We may as well shut down the rebellion and pay our own tickets to go to work in the Iridium mines, because that will be it. 
Over. Done. The two stared at each other for a second, and Altia took a step toward Nave. Now, she said, after I have once again explained all that, do you still want to delay our mission and break into the first human structure we come across, just so you can look for soup? Nave didn't answer straight away. He stared intently at Altia, trying to work out just exactly how angry she was with him. I really do fancy some soup, he said. I'll make it, if we find some. It didn't take Altia long to break into the building, which was surprisingly large, with various rooms, a garage for small vehicles, and a storage area for samples and science equipment. Nave went straight to the kitchen, guided by some unerring instinct, and found a supply of food. Bingo, he declared, as he pulled out a couple of cups of self-heating soup. They both sat at the kitchen table and stared poking at their soup with plastic spoons until all the dry bits had softened up and everything was liquid enough to eat. Looks delicious, Altia said, obvious sarcasm in her voice as she gave the soup which had been a freeze-dried block until moments before, a suspicious look. It is, Nave told her, choosing to ignore the sarcasm as he ate. He chewed pensively at the croutons for a moment, then said, I'm surprised we haven't met anyone yet. It's not surprising really, Altia told him. Like I told you, there are only a few thousand scientists down here on the planet. You rarely run into anyone by accident. Okay, Nave said, blowing on another scalding spoonful of the broth. So if it's so difficult to run into people down here on the planet, how are you planning to find Brax? He will be at the eye, she said, which is located at the bottom of this rift. She hesitated a moment, tried some of the soup and grimaced. But I must hack into the local system now and find any data Brax has left for me. That will contain his exact position, and hopefully a lot more besides. So finish your soup, Knave. Sounds like a good idea, Knave said. But can you do that without giving us away? Don't worry, Altia told him. I know the security systems on this planet like the back of my hand. Hey, Knave said. If such amazing things are happening here, Shavir herself is probably on her way to take charge. I don't think so. Altia said, taking another spoonful and grimacing not quite as much as the time before. Why not? Because Shavir has to ensure her candidate is chosen as the new emperor. She is stuck at the electoral gathering until a decision has been made on the succession, and probably longer, because she will want to ensure the chosen candidate actually makes it to the throne in one piece. OK, Nave said. But it's extremely dangerous to keep secrets from Shavir. She has to at least know about the eye opening. She's probably sending a lot more scientists to study it. Ha! Altia snorted bitterly, raising her plastic spoon to attract his attention. If you think that, then you don't know Shavir. She wants scientific knowledge for herself. She hoards it like a rat hoards crumbs of bread, fighting jealously to protect every last morsel. Knowledge is shared in the scientific community despite her, not with her help. If anything, she will have reduced the number of scientists here to avoid any of them learning drifter secrets that she doesn't already know. My rise to become her intellectual rival and to surpass her in my understanding of the drifters will have made her even more venal and mistrustful than she was before. You're quite something, Knave said, with a lopsided grin. Hey, does this mean Brax is joining the rebellion? No, Altia snorted. I doubt it. Not old Brax. Altia found a hologram projector among the equipment stored at the science station and brought it into the kitchen, and Nave cooked them something more appetizing than the soup while she searched for the information she was sure Brax had left them. This is strange, she said a complex hologram of tunnels and chambers slowly rotating in the air in front of her. I have found the area of substrate that Brax is investigating, and the events he believes foretell the opening of the eye. But there is something wrong. What do you mean? 
I mean, it looks, from the hologram, like the area around the eye has been reconfigured. I know this entire world like I know the streets of the town I was first sent to, to study at Science Academy when I was twelve. They are imprinted in my mind, burnt into a deep layer of the subconscious, after years of study and contemplation. This map does not correspond to what I remember. It's not so strange, Nave said. Maps are bullshit. I know all about it from my time in the military. You can't trust maps. A million things might have changed since your map was made. No, Altia said. You still don't understand. That's just it. Things never change on this planet. Never. Not even on a geological time scale. Unless... Unless what? Unless Brax is right. And the eye really is opening. Chapter 7 Posia lifted the communicator to her lips and yelled into it, her eyes wide, her voice high and terrified. Brax! she yelled. There's something wrong! There's something very wrong! Come back to the intersection! Both Altia and Nave heard the message, still sitting in the kitchen. Altia was using the hologram projector console in conjunction with a node of the local communications system to gather all the information about what had been discovered at Drifter Prime in the time since she had left to become a rebel. What was that? Nave asked. That was a message sent directly to Brax, Altia said. It wasn't transmitted over an open channel. Only Brax will have heard it, apart from any skilled hackers who have infiltrated this site and are listening in. You mean us, Nave said. We heard it too. Exactly, but only because I happened to be hacked into the system. Otherwise we wouldn't have heard it either. That woman sounded terrified, Nave said. Yes, Altia nodded, like some experiment had gone badly wrong. No, Nave said grimly. It was worse than that. I've only ever heard people screaming like that during combat. Nobody's in combat on this planet, Altia said dismissively, and scientists can become very involved in their work. There are some real divas on the staff here, or there were when I was in charge, but I think we should go take a look. Nave jumped to the side, dabbing his armour badge with the fingers of one hand to activate it, and drawing his block gun with the other hand as he did so. In response to his touch of the badge, armour panels spread instantaneously to cover his body. There were other effects, too. The armour was an item of drifter manufacture with many properties that seemed magical from the primitive perspective of the Tarazet Star Empire. It could fold out to produce a giant suit of power armour or fold up to be no bigger than a badge worn on the chest. Within a fully deployed suit of armour, there was a time dilation effect that meant things around the wearer seemed to be moving in slow motion, allowing them to react very quickly to threats. And most magical of all, a mental bond was formed between people in armour at the same location, allowing them to share thoughts and feelings on a level below language. OK, he said, I saw movement. Where? Altia asked though she didn't bother with gun or armour, unlike Knave. Right there, Knave said, pointing his gun to indicate the direction. A power's cursed hole just opened in the floor. I see it, Altia said. Is that some kind of trap? Knave asked. Is it a trap door designed to open and dump us twenty feet onto spikes? By the powers, Knave, you certainly do have an imagination. Yeah, he agreed. And right now, I'm imagining a hundred other traps that could be hidden down there. It's the reconfiguration of the local architecture. In preparation for the opening of the eye, Altia said. It is accelerating. It's happening fast enough for us to be aware of it. Brax jumped in a grav transport and returned to Posia as soon as he could. But that was some twenty minutes after she had started screaming into her communicator. He emerged from the new tunnel to see a scene of horror. His eyes were immediately drawn to splashes of red across the walls of the intersection. Posey's body was lying on the ground, leaving no doubt where the blood had come from. Three figures were staring at her. 
The two enigmatic figures in their grey uniforms and distinctive headgear were standing near the body, both holding light tubes to better illuminate it. A little distance away, Yatena was standing by a small vehicle. Yatena, Brax called, making her scream and drop the communicator. It's you, Brax, she said when she recognised him in the dim light. Thank the powers you're here. What happened here? Brax asked, coming to stand beside Yatena. I don't know, she said, voice distraught. Posey is dead. How did it happen? Brax asked. Neither of the two figures in grey had bothered to look round at the sound of his voice, not the man nor the woman. I was away, Yatena said, getting some equipment. When I got back, I, I found this. Did you ask either of our two friends what happened? Brax asked, voice low to avoid either of the grey-clad figures from hearing. The male one was with me, Yatena said. I asked him to come with me to help me get the stuff. The woman stayed here with Posia. Have you asked her what happened? No, Yatena said. I haven't. I didn't know what to do. Look at the body. Just look at it. That used to be Posia just a few minutes ago. Brax nodded a little too impassively for Yatena's liking, and went over to the body. It had been crushed and torn, with fountains of blood splashing the walls in four or five directions. It was almost like two giant hands had picked her up, wrung her out like a dirty dishcloth, and let her fall back to the floor. Do you know what could have done that to a person? Yatena called over to him from the vehicle. Brax shook his head and turned his attention to the female figure in grey. She was illuminated by a light stick she was holding, and her attention was on Posia. Posia's blood was splashed across her grey uniform. It was hard to see the crimson blood against her charcoal grey uniform in the dark, but the few drops that had spattered the woman's face were impossible not to see. Hey, Brax said, attracting the woman's attention. Did you see what happened here? I saw it, yes, she said, her face impassive. Okay, that's something. So what happened? Posia was killed. Yes, okay, Brax said sympathetically, glancing again at Posia. Can you tell me any more? No, the emotionless woman in grey said. I do not understand what I saw, or the reasons for it. It is a mystery to me. The alien scientist looked up from her work, the two dark sensor pits in her smooth, skull-like face pointing in the direction she had detected a disturbance. It was right on the edge of the threshold that her sensors were able to detect. She was tempted to ignore it as a false positive, very tempted. She had her visual sensors turned up to maximum, and artifacts emerging from nowhere were not uncommon. It was simple feedback from sensor systems, pushed to the limits and could usually be safely ignored. Ordinarily, the scientist would have paid it no heed, but today was different. Something very localised was happening among the systems of the Drifter architecture on Ice Tomb. The systems were long dead, of course, completely inert, and yet she saw, or thought she saw, realignments. She stared in the direction she thought she had seen something. Her patient observation of the spot was rewarded when something absolutely unmistakable happened. Something that could not be attributed to a sensor overreacting to a little feedback. A hole was opening in the wall in front of her. There had been no doorway, just blank wall, but now an aperture a few inches across had opened and it continued to enlarge. The scientist switched on all the sensing and recording systems installed within her enlarged and extended exoskeleton. She also exuded a scream of pheromones, an incohate wail of silent excitement transmitted through the sense of smell. Communication systems embedded within the room scientific apparatus picked up the chemicals and transmitted them around the base. They were so intense that they were assigned a high importance and also transmitted up to the swarm commander in orbit. In response, three of her most senior fellow scientists came skittering into the room, 
in time to see that the aperture now filled the entire wall. It was large enough for two of her kind to walk along side by side. What is this? asked the scientist who was immediately her junior. He was a gifted and insightful researcher, but his mentality was lesser than hers. It's a corridor, the scientist told him. It is new, her junior said. Yes, the alien scientist said. I told you the eye was opening, and here is the first sign of it. It is a momentous occasion. We must investigate, the youngest and most junior of them said. We must venture down this new corridor and find the meaning of this translation. We need to know what it means when the eye opens. Not we, the scientist said to her underlings. I... I will investigate this corridor. The glory of the discoveries to be found within shall forever be associated with my hive. The others nodded in agreement. It was how things were done. There is an incoming message, said the most junior of them, a good scientist, but not one touched by her genius. Put it through, she instructed and suddenly they were joined by the glowing hologram of another alien of their type. Swarm Commander, the scientist said, a new area has been discovered within this complex. It must be explored, and I will require a large and capable escort of warriors to ensure my safety. Of course, the Swarm Commander told her. How many warriors will you need? The scientist looked to the new opening and the corridor leading down into the bowels of the planet, then back at the swarm commander. I will require ten of your finest warriors, she said, for a start. Altea and Nave emerged into an open space, the location Altea had determined the message to have come from, to be greeted by the same scene of horror that had greeted Brax. Four figures were standing around the mutilated corpse of one of their colleagues. Brax, Altea called, causing all four to spin round. Altea, both Brax and Yatena called back in surprise. Then Nave saw Yatena reach for something in her jacket. On instinct, he went for his own pocket and pulled out his block gun, the block of inert-looking metal, transforming into a gun as he raised it to cover Yatena. She already had a communicator to her ear and was about to open a channel when Nave bellowed at her. Not so fast, he yelled, extending the gun menacingly. Yatena's mouth had been half open to speak, but she closed it again and put the communicator back in her pocket. The two people in grey watched everything impassively, neither doing or saying anything to intervene. We don't need guns, Brax said. Of course not. Altea agreed, shooting Knave a disapproving glare. Put the pistol away, Knave. Knave slowly lowered his gun and returned it to his pocket. That's drifter technology, Yatena said. That gun, even their clothes, it's all made of drifter metal. Altea nodded in confirmation of her words, but she didn't say anything in reply. Altea has come back to help us, Brax said turning away from Nave and Altea to look at the remains of Posia. And, by the looks of what remains of poor Posia, we need all the help we can get. Nave subtly signalled to Altea, directing her attention to the two enigmatic figures in grey uniforms. Altea glanced at them and frowned, unsure what to make of them. Those two characters in grey look a little off, Nave said especially seeing as one of them is covered in blood. I agree, Altea said, and I don't recognise their uniforms. They aren't science staff, but that's not any navy uniform I recognise either. Do you know it from your time in the infantry? Nope, Nave replied, and it's not just the uniform. There's something weird about the way they just stand there. Altea walked over to the two figures in grey, walking round them to stand between them and the body, right in their sightline. Who are you? Altea asked, addressing the two figures directly. They won't answer, Brax said. 
Not unless we add you to their approved operator list. They're what? Altea said. Are they androids? Nave asked. No, Brax replied. They are most definitely not androids. I am an android. They're monsters is what they are, Yatena said. The living dead, creatures of nightmare. Now, Yatena, Brax remonstrated, we are scientists after all. We have to open your eyes, Brax, Yatena screamed, pointing at the dead body, then at the blood-splattered woman in grey. Look at this, and look at her. She ripped Posey a limb from powers be cursed limb. We don't know that, Brax said. Ask her, Yatena said. Just ask her. I have. You heard me. She doesn't remember. Brax started to say, but Yatena had already turned her attention away from him again. She took a step toward the female in grey, her eyes intense. Look at me, she barked. What happened here? Tell me! I do not have the words to describe the occurrence definitively. I am unsure. What killed her? Yatena asked, voice harsh, threatening. You know! Tell us! I don't know. That's bullshit! Yatena screamed. Maybe you're asking the wrong questions, Nave said. Oh! Yatena rounded on him. And what would the right question be? Ask her what she saw. What kind of stupid question is... Yatena was saying, voice loud and exasperated when Brax nodded. That might work, he said, and he moved to stand beside Altea in the woman's eyeline. What did you see when Posia died? I saw shadows, the woman said, and a wing maybe. I saw claws, I think, but it was dark and I was not looking directly. You saw a creature? Brax asked. No, the woman shook her head. It was not simply a creature or a robot. It was not an android or a drone, not a buzzer or any other type of alien ever encountered in the history of the entire Tarazet Star Empire. I did not see it. I did not see how it killed Posia, only that she died, and I do not know what it was. I cannot tell you anything useful about what happened. A creature! Yatena snorted. My ass! You have been helpful, thank you, Brax said. It must have been traumatic. The woman did not frown or smile. She didn't react to being thanked in any way. Nor to the traumatic attack she had likely seen but not understood. Altea's expression had gradually been becoming more horrified, her shoulders gradually tightening. She took a step towards Brax and put her hand gently on his metal and plastic shoulder. What is she, old friend? Altea asked. A horror show, Yatena said. A reanimated officer, Brax said. Reanimated, Nave said, voice a little higher than he would have liked because of the shock and surprise. Are you telling me she's a zombie? At last, Yatena said, got it in one. But? Nave felt like there was something very important that needed to be said. Something about having zombies around was probably a bad idea but he couldn't quite put it into words. That's crazy, Altea said. You said it, Yatena muttered. It is a program initiated by Shavia herself, Brax said, along with an only just perceptible shrug. She thinks these officers in grey are vital to the future of the Empire. She's even more obsessed with them than she is with capturing your ship and we all know how intense her desire to get her hands on your ship is. Reanimated, Altea whispered, staring at the two officers in grey. She's finally lost her mind. What technology is used to re- That's not important now, Brax interrupted her. If there is a creature, if, Yatena snorted. Then that, Brax continued, the plastic muscles around his eyes narrowing in annoyance, is our most pressing issue. No way, Yatena said. There is no monster. There is only a psychotic corpse in a grey uniform that doesn't know when to lie down and just be dead. 
And what about Posia? Are we just going to leave her there, or are we going to reanimate her too? The male officer in grey opened his mouth for the first time. The process requires remains in considerably better condition. No! Yatena almost screamed at him. Just no! That was not a serious question. I will task some automated units with retrieving her remains, Brax said, voice respectfully low. What the hell is going on here? Yatena growled. Poshir is dead, killed by a malfunctioning Zed officer, and now, here you are, palling about with revolutionaries, including Altir herself, the number one traitor to the Tarazet Star Empire. This all has to be reported. I have to tell your superiors. I do not have any superiors, Brax said. His normally quiet and humble voice was suddenly imperious and commanding. He took a step toward Yatena, who was forced to take an involuntary step back, that or stare the android directly in the face, eye to eye. She chose the former. In the hierarchy of the science ministry, only one person occupies a position more senior than mine. That person is arch-science advisor Shavir herself. In matters to do with Drifter Prime, I have absolute authority. If you mention reporting this one more time, or if you share information about what has occurred here with any other member of staff on this planet or elsewhere, there will be terrible consequences for you. Do you understand? Yatena just stared back at him without saying a word for a long second. She was visibly suffering the effects of shock, thrown out of mental equilibrium after looking at the mangled remains of her co-worker. At last she gathered herself, but there was still a manic gleam in her eye. I understand, she said. Oh, I understand all right. What now? Nave asked. He'd had enough of all the bickering and uncertainty. Brax turned to look at Nave appraisingly, then nodded, deciding it was a good idea to move on from the tableau of horror they were standing before. I suggest we investigate that corridor, Brax said. The answer to whatever happened here is down there, with the eye. How? Yatena asked obviously unready to just move on. How does the answer lie down there? The answer is right here, spattered from head to toe in blood. The answer is that Shavir is sending us lobotomized psychopaths to watch us and report back to her. This is nothing to do with the eye, and frankly, I'm not interested in doing any science until we find out what is going on. Lobotomized? Altir shot a look at Brax. If I thought for one moment that this Zed officer was responsible for this, I would, Brax started to say, before cutting himself off. But I don't. I believe there is a creature, despite the fact that we haven't seen any evidence of creatures inhabiting drifter sites before. Exactly, Yatena said. We haven't. Perhaps you haven't, Altea said quietly. But we have. Nave nodded. You have? Brax's voice was suddenly less somber, suddenly suffused with surprise and delight. In a drifter structure on a similar scale to this one, Altea told him, a drifter complex hidden within the core of a gas giant. A drifter complex within a gas giant. It sounded from Brax's tone of voice like he was hearing about this for the very first time. Imperial ship saw us descend into the gas giant, followed us even, Nave said. Didn't Shavir tell you about this? No, Brax said, but that doesn't matter now. Tell me, Altia, what are these creatures? What is their physicality, and why would one of them do something like this? I don't know, Altia said, approaching the remains of Posia. Nave half expected her to turn away but she was experienced with combat and she had a scientific curiosity. She didn't avert her eyes even an inch. She stared at the damage the creature had done. 
Knave decided he wouldn't go stand beside her. He could see enough of the carnage, plenty, from where he was. You must make a recording of this, Altia said to Brax. When your robots come to take away the remains, you absolutely have to record all of this. This is the work of the creature we saw, isn't it, Knave? Altia looked over her shoulder at Knave, seeking his confirmation, but he wasn't so sure. Anything big could have done that, he told her. I've seen drones step on people and leave a mess like that. He demonstrated by stamping on the floor and twisting his ankle as if he was treading on an insect. It could be our creature, he added, but it could just as easily be a wolfhound drone. One of them stepping on you will mess you up. They have big feet for loosely packed asteroid surfaces, deserts, snow, and that so... Okay, Altia said, losing interest in what he had to say, as she turned again to stare at the forlorn sight of Posia's remains. And another thing, Brax, Knave said, turning to address the android. I wouldn't be in such a hurry to go running off down that corridor. If it is one of those creatures we saw, big if, Yatana said, still unconvinced there was anyone on the planet except the scientists themselves. If it is, Knave continued, it is a very tough cookie, a very tough cookie. What? Brax mumbled, turning to Altia for a translation. He means, she said, inclining her head towards Brax, but not taking her eyes off the dead body, that the creature is robust and capable of causing great damage. Oh, Brax said and nodded. I somehow saw the drifters more as philosophers, you know, in togas. Thinkers, not fighters. It isn't a drifter, Altia said at last, turning away from the remains, after having seen enough. At least I very much doubt it. I think it is a servitor creature, used by the drifters the way we use drones. Or it might not even be as significant as that. It may not ever have had any contact with the drifters at all, an inhabitant of the architecture they built that arrived long after the downfall of their civilization. Altia looked up and swept her arm around her to indicate all the drifter architecture around them. Is that hypothesis based on anything? Brax asked. Maybe we could talk about this somewhere a little less exposed, Knave said looking up and down the corridor. We have no fortifications, Brax said. Maybe, Knave nodded, but that doesn't mean we should stay here asking for trouble. Brax nodded. So you are convinced this creature is a threat? Or perhaps we could simply locate the creature and make contact with it? I would so like to see a living inhabitant of this place and perhaps talk with it. Knave's right. Altia said. They are too capable of defending themselves. We should wait until we have a better idea of its motivation, and we can be more sure of our safety in its presence. We will proceed down the corridor, as you suggest, but we should take security precautions and supplies. Chapter 8 Romina's ship rendezvoused with another two ships a week later. By then, Vela had run a lot of training missions on simulators. She was starting to feel very confident about piloting the armour that had been chosen for the mission and about wrangling the drones. She went to the bridge to get a good look at the other two ships and she was surprised by how modern they were. A small science vessel and a large dropship. See that dropship, Romina said. All the goodies inside are ours. Our client is here too. Her name is Farron. We'll all three be going down to the temple immediately. Temple, Vela said. Vela looked at the temple in the distance. It wasn't big by the standards of the architecture of the Tarazet Star Empire, but there was something about it, some presence. Vela could feel it. Who built this? Vela asked Farron. If you ask me, it doesn't fit with the rest of the landscaping on this planet. That's none of your concern, Farron said. 
Your role here is simply muscle. You are just a sort of scientific mercenary and not privy to all the dig secrets. You don't know everything, and you are not intended to know everything. All you need to know is that you should think twice before you ask any questions. Nobody round here likes questions, okay? Okay, boss, Vela said, focusing her attention back on the drone, monitoring its movements with her mind. Ignoring the real world around her, though calling the ridiculous excess of a specially terraformed and sculpted planet, the real world was a stretch. Farron stood at the top of the dropship ramp, looking down it at the planet's surface below. Vela was already at the bottom of the ramp waiting for her, but she hesitated to follow. She was finding it hard even to set foot on the ramp, never mind descend it and walk on the surface of the planet again. Romina came to stand beside her, the footfalls of her massive suit of armour echoing round the inside of the hold of the spaceship. The two stood there in silence for a moment. Romina took a moment to marvel at the greenness of the grass the ramp door led out onto and the mellifluous sound of birdsong on the air. Problem? Romina asked. Farron was also encased in one of the suits of armour and the massive head of Farron's suit turned slowly to regard Romina. The suits had an opaque faceplate which meant Romina could peek through the faceplate to see Farron's face. But the fear was easy enough to see in her behaviour, and hear in her voice once she started speaking. It's the first time I've been back here since the incident, Farron said. It was bad, was it? Romina probed, never missing an opportunity to try and winkle out more information about the events that had sent Farron scuttling away from the planet to seek bodyguards. No, Farron said, slowly but surely regaining her resolve and composure. It was a simple accident. We encountered a life form and we were not equipped to protect ourselves. Something like a gentan roach? Romina asked. As I told you, Farron replied, we don't have any recordings or measurements of the incident. The creature was dangerous enough to be able to kill three scientists, but many life forms are. All this armor, all these weapons, they're undoubtedly overkill, but until we know more, we must try to ensure the staff on the planet are exposed to as little risk as possible. Understood, Romina said. So, Farron continued, now that we are tooled up with all our war gear, let us investigate the site and flush out whatever creature this ancient temple has been harboring. Farron took one hesitant step, then strode down the ramp to join Vela at the bottom. Once she was on the grass, she could see that the dropship was ringed by drones, each one looking outwards, scanning the surrounding woodland for any sign of threat. Whatever it is, Vela said, it isn't going to be coming from the forest, is it? No. Romina said, following Farron down the ramp. Most likely we'll have to go into the temple and find its lair. Okay, Vela nodded. I guess you can leave a drone here, Romina said, to make sure nothing tries to go aboard while we're not here. No problem, Vela said, picking a drone at random to assign to guard duty on the dropship. The drone suggested various patrol patterns, but Vela just overrode them and tasked the drone to stay in one place, standing at the bottom of the ramp. Nothing fancy, Vela told it, just stand there and shoot any local life forms that you don't like the look of. The drone beeped to confirmation and froze, as immobile as a statue. Vela didn't bother setting a time limit on the drone's new behaviour, and she was suddenly struck by the notion that if none of them ever came back, the drone would just stand there till the end of time, or until its power source ran dry a few centuries hence. That was ridiculous, of course, she decided, and followed Romina. It only took them half an hour to walk to the temple, the giant strides of their armoured legs eating up the distance between the landing site they had selected and the temple site by the side of the lake. There is only one entrance, and the staircase that descends from it ends in the lake, Vela observed. We rigged up a ramp, 
Farron told her, so we wouldn't get our feet wet. Do you see it? Off to the side. What weight is it set up to carry? Romina asked. Don't worry, Farron assured her. It's very heavy duty. It will support as many drones as you want to send up it, and you can go stomping around on it in your armor. It's designed to take a grav barge loaded with rock or metal. Your drones are nothing compared to that. Great, Romina said. But I don't want to go stomping around on it just yet. This is as far as we go for now. We'll send up a drone to go take a look around, and we'll see what we can see. Vela, you pilot it, and provide a feed for me and Farron, a real-time one, so we can see what's going on as well. Okay, Vela said. Sending the nearest drone up the ramp now, when to four, and you should already have pictures. Receiving, Romina confirmed, and they are nice crisp visuals. These Wender-class drones really are superbly engineered. They aren't quite the same standard as an archaeological scout drone, Farron said. But they aren't as bad as I had been expecting. The drone reached the top of the ramp, which delivered it to a narrow ledge that ran all round the entrance level of the pyramid. The entrance to the structure was just a few steps away, and it was large and circular. A small animal was sniffing around to one side of the door. It looked like some form of vermin, but its coat was too bright, too blue, for it to look entirely convincing. What is that thing? Vela asked, as the creature caught sight of the drone she was remotely piloting and scampered away. One of the genetically engineered creatures that make up the local ecosystem, Farron said, her voice resigned. That's one of the more restrained ones. Are you telling me this planet is designed right down to the rats? Vela asked, voice incredulous. How much would that even cost? How is that even possible? Put it this way, Romina said. You'd have to go into the vines and cut down a lot of nuts to pay for it. They're not really nuts, Vela said. They're more like a kind of squash. Okay, enough of this chit-chat, Romina said. The levity that had been detectable in her gravely digitized voice was gone as quickly as it had come. Send in the drone. The drone sensors adjusted instantly to the dim light inside the temple, and a red crosshairs danced across the video feed it was sending back as it detected more of the vermin inside the temple. The creatures scuttled off into deeper shadow, each one followed by a red crosshairs. You can take the rats off the target list, Romina said. Whatever we're looking for in here, it isn't them. Okay, Vela said, swiftly making the adjustments to the drone's programming, which resulted in the red crosshairs disappearing, leaving the view of the inside of the temple clear. There was one large space, and a corridor leading away on the other side. Nothing in here, Vela said. That's not strictly true. Farron said. There are several interesting architectural features associated with this space, but we were able to catalogue them very thoroughly. You can safely proceed to the corridor without paying this space much heed. You heard her, Romina said. Let's take a few steps into that corridor, shall we? Entering corridor, Vela confirmed, and sent the appropriate commands to the drone through the drone control system built into the helmet of her armour. She could feel it clasping her head like a complex glove, and it was a cutting-edge system, requiring just a whisper of a thought to send the drone marching confidently into the corridor. There were no lights inside, and the drone's image feed was starting to degrade. Sensors or floodlights? Vela asked Romina. Light the place up, Romina told her. I don't like sensors. I prefer to see real colours not the ghosts and 3D renders you get from sensor readings. Lights on, Vela said. The Wender had two giant lamps mounted, one at each shoulder and another smaller one in the centre of its forehead. The three beams lanced through the dark, banishing all but the darkest shadows out to a range of a few hundred yards and providing some dim idea of what was beyond out to another couple hundred yards beyond that. Nothing here, Vela said.
While the rest of the group sat at a round table, studded with hologram projectors, Altea stood by the window, looking out. They had returned to the science centre when they had found the soup. The window looked out onto the rift, the chasm of drifter technology located directly above the eye. But all that was on the other side of a thick window of armoured, transparent metal. The room was silent, and she had descended into her own thoughts, contemplating the rift and the eye, remembering old times. It's good to be back, she said. Really? Brax looked up from a page of data he had been studying, intrigued. You know, I wasn't expecting you to answer my call. I thought, with a whole spaceship of living drifter technology to play with, you wouldn't be coming back to visit me in this mausoleum of dead technology. Dead and rotten, Yatena muttered, glaring out through the window at the opposite wall of the chasm at the drifter technology that filled the view. It was dead, Altea said, but not any longer, at least not down there below us, around the eye. Don't you feel it? The eye is opening. You think so? Yatena asked apprehensively. Really? That's excellent news, Brax said. That's bad news, Nave muttered. Everyone turned to look at him, including Altea at the window, and both Brax and Yatena, who were sitting at the table with him. The only people who didn't look at him were the two officers dressed in grey, who without a dead body to stare at, were looking blankly into space. Bad? Altea prompted. Well, yes. Hasn't anyone realised yet that the spaceship is our edge? We are the only people in this entire galaxy who have an artefact of living drifter technology. It allows us to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the heaviest and most advanced spaceships of the Tarazet Deep Space Navy. If everyone has one, suddenly we won't be special anymore. Before you know it, it'll all be over for us and our spaceship, and we'll be thrown into jail or worse. Altea nodded. And who will lead the rebellion then? Exactly, Nave continued. There won't be a rebellion to lead. Who cares about the rebellion? Who cares about the Empire? Brax said. When the eye is opening, it's the biggest thing to happen in this galaxy's recent history. All our little political squabbles pale into insignificance in comparison to that. To the powers with the rebellion. What does that even mean? Nave asked. The eye opening? Nobody has been able to explain it to me yet. The answer is there, Altea said, pointing through the glass. Their eyes followed where she pointed, and they could all see it. An instant of light, winking on and then fading away again just as quickly. Whoa, Nave said. Stuff moving around. Lights flashing. Something is sure happening here. A portal is my guess, Brax said softly. It's just a gut feeling, nothing scientific, but something called the eye. It has to be a portal, right? Sounds nice. Like your toga-wearing philosopher drifters, Nave said derisively. You aren't going to be able to keep all of this from Shavir forever, Yatena said. I haven't seen you report any of this to her yet. When was the last time you even reported to her? All this will not remain secret long, Brax agreed. We must hurry. He turned away from staring out the window and returned his attention to Nave. Nave, if this creature is like the one you saw before, what equipment will we need to take in order to be able to repel it if it attacks? The one we saw, Nave said stood its ground against numerous heavy drones. It was a very impressive display of power, Altea agreed. The creature was injured, malnourished and exhausted. It had no armour or weapons, and yet it fought with our war machines on an even footing. It isn't invulnerable. It wouldn't have survived or escaped if we hadn't helped it, Nave said. I think we need twenty drones. That should be enough to make it think twice about messing with us. Twenty? Brax spat the word in shock. That's a tall order. This is a scientific mission. There are drones, 
but retasking 20 is going to be difficult to hide. Yatena smiled smugly at him, seeming to enjoy his unease. It makes it even more likely that Shavir will discover what you're doing here, though it looks like you don't even know yourself. It can be done, Brax said wincing at the thought of the chicanery that would be involved in getting the twenty drones that Knave wanted. But it will take time. I can't just take the nearest batch of drones. I have to be more circumspect than that. I have to take one here, one there, until we have twenty. Some will have to be transported a considerable distance. They'll be here in two days. They didn't move from the science station for two days, and Brax, for some reason Knave didn't understand, insisted they confine themselves to a limited number of rooms. It was an uneasy time for Knave, while Altea and Brax spent a lot of time in conversation about things that simply went over his head, and the two enigmatic figures in grey weren't much into conversation at all. That left Yatena as the only other person he could pass the time with. It was a time punctuated by many long silences. I'm basically a prisoner, Yatena said, at one particularly low ebb. You pointed a gun at me. You were going to shoot me if I used my radio. Brax won't let me contact Shavir. I don't know if I was really going to shoot you, Knave said, attempting a disarming smile. You looked pretty convincing, she muttered. You've shot people before, right? He nodded his head slowly. For the rebellion? Yeah, for the rebellion, Knave nodded. It makes it sound so noble, doesn't it? To say it's for the rebellion. Yatena stared at him for a second before slowly shaking her head. No, it does not. It's just as stupid a reason for killing somebody as any other. Then it was Knave's turn to fall silent for a while. Chapter 9 And then, at last, the first of the drones started to arrive, but they didn't all come at once. Brax had them form up in a garage below the science station in dribs and drabs as they arrived. He also set up a hologram console where they were all spending most of their time sitting, a few floors above the garage, showing the feed of the video from the garage. It chimed and flashed with the arrival of each new drone. Knave immediately recognised the headless ostrich design with giant legs below and small weapon pods on the side. He squinted to make sure then nodded in confirmation as he noticed they all had a large nose-mounted mass driver. That clinched it. He would know this particular drone design anywhere. Wolfhounds, Knave said, pointing at the hologram screen, even though nobody was listening to him. They're painted a funny colour, but they are wolfhounds, he said, a little louder, to attract attention. Are wolfhounds good? Altia asked finally detecting the excitement in his voice and looking up. Yeah, they are, Knave grinned. Remember, I was running wolfhounds when we met. I was wrangling a pack of them for the navy. Brax raised an eyebrow at that, but Altea ignored it. She knew how incongruous it was for one of the leading scientists of the Tarazet Star Empire to end up with a lowly planetary assault infantry soldier and not even an officer, just a drone operator. But she didn't owe anybody any explanations. He was more than that now, of course. He was one of the leaders of the rebellion. But her feelings for him had started to grow before all that. They had been growing close when he was just an infantryman assigned to her as a glorified lab rat. They have good guns, Knave added. That mass driver in the nose will mess a target up. Armor's not bad, but most importantly, they are smart. I always wondered if they secretly had AI. Impossible, Brax said. Who would put AI into a combat drone? You're probably right, I guess, Knave nodded. But believe me, 
We'll do fine stomping around down here with a pack of wolfhounds to put between us and trouble. Brax and Altea were very keen to head out and see what was happening at the eye. Brax, especially, found it very difficult to wait until Knave had organised and programmed the drones that were there to protect them. It took hours of checking their components and checking their rules of engagement before he was happy with them. By then, everyone was ready to leave the science station they had been cooped up in. Everyone except Yatena. I don't want to go, she said. It's too late for that, Brax told her. Yatena and he were sitting in the front two seats of a grav car, side by side, the two Z officers in grey sitting behind them, blank-eyed and unmoving. All four of them were wearing armoured slim suits. Altea and Nave weren't in the car with them because the expedition was taking two cars, and they were in the lead car. Ten drones were arrayed ahead of the lead car, and ten drones behind the car with Yatena, Brax, and the two figures in grey. They were finally about to start investigating the planet's area of new architecture after what had seemed to Brax to be an interminable delay. Yatena was the only fly in the ointment. I mean it, Yatena said. You saw what happened to Posia. She was alone, Brax said, and now we have half an army of drones with us. I've never seen so many in one place and Altea and Nave are armed with weapons created by the Drifters. It's difficult to judge the risk involved in an expedition like this, but we have taken as many precautions as practicable. Now is the time to act. There was blood, Yatena said. So much blood. Brax turned his attention away from her and directed it instead to a small hologram projector built into the vehicle's dash. He pushed a virtual button in the display and the car was shaken by a small tremor. Scout 1 launched, Brax said over the open channel, so that Altea and Nave could hear. Excellent, Altea's voice came in return, transmitted from the lead car. We are already receiving pictures, audio and a range of other sensor data. The scout drone that Brax had just launched was quite sophisticated by drone standards but that didn't mean it was much to look at. It was a small ball, with miniaturised gravitic drives in the lower half and rudimentary intelligence and sensors in the upper half. It was painted a bright and cheerful orange and its upper surface was scattered with sensor ports and lenses. I'm sending Scout 1 down the corridor now, Brax said, touching another virtual button in his display as he did so. Rather rich than me, Yatena grumbled to herself. She could hardly bear to look at the display, where the corridor could be seen through the drone's eyes as it floated bravely onward. There wasn't enough light for it to passively see where it was going very well, so it projected a small cone of light from a lamp built into its front. At the same time, lasers were sweeping from ports on its side, building a detailed 3D map of the architecture surrounding it. Do you see anything unusual in the architecture? Brax asked over the communications link. A few novelties, Altea replied, but nothing substantially different to what we have seen before. Does it look safe? Shall we begin to follow? Brax asked. Whoa! Knave's voice came over the communicator. That's a negatory. What's the point of sending a scout drone if we are just going to follow right on its ass? Nice, Yatena muttered. Nice language. This guy's professionalism is making me feel a lot safer. He's right, Altea said. We don't move until we start to encounter signal degradation. We'll have to move then, to keep the feed from going down, OK? OK, Brax agreed, reluctantly. How far can those things broadcast anyway? Yatena asked. Depends how much architecture there is intervening between us, Brax said. That little drone isn't good at punching a signal through these massive walls. But if the corridor continues on straight, 
We're talking miles of unhindered reception. Yatena nodded, then grimaced at the next thing she heard. We have a corner, Nave said. The drone didn't hesitate or slow down. It didn't know fear, and nothing would stop it going forward except a real tangible obstacle of some sort. The drone disappeared round the corner, but there was no loss of quality in the pictures or the other data it was sending back. No degradation in signal, Nave said. But the architecture is different, Altia said. It is already a very different style to the architecture here, just a few hundred yards away. Yes, Brax agreed. There are fewer hieroglyphs carved into the walls, and the arches are taller, the corridor narrower than usual. The drone continued on, along another long corridor, then came to a halt. The picture wasn't degrading much yet, but it was dark and difficult to see what was happening. Why has it stopped? Nave asked. There is a branching tunnel, Altia told him, after glancing at the three-dimensional map of the area being built up by the drone. It's waiting for us to decide which way to send it. The new corridor branched to the left, but it wasn't as tall as the main corridor. It definitely looked of lesser importance than the corridor the drone was already moving along. What do you think, Brax? Altia asked. Onward, Brax said, and the drone accelerated once more, the cone of light it projected picking out the general contours of the corridor ahead, which were then mapped out in more detail in the three-dimensional model as the lasers projecting from the side played over them. Is that a dead end? Nave's voice again. They all stared at the image in their respective holograms, a bronze wall, only sparsely incised with hieroglyphs, but with numerous mechanisms and conduits embedded. A lot of the conduits seemed to be travelling up and down rather than left to right. There's a pit below the scout probe, Brack said, as he examined the data from the mapping lasers. It isn't obvious in the visual display, but the lasers can see it just fine. I see it too, Altia said. The shaft doesn't continue above the drone, it only goes down. The grav cars will be fine, Brax said. But is this pit shaft going to be a problem for your drones, Knave? They can climb, Knave reassured him. Not well, but if the architecture is as bumpy as what I've seen so far, they should do okay. It will take time, though. You'll be glad to hear, Brax, that I think we can start moving now. We will need some time to climb that shaft and not let the scout drone get too far ahead of us as we descend. Now you're talking, Brax said, a smile playing across the few plastic muscles of his face. No way, Yatena barked into the communicator. Can't you see the drone is descending into the pits of hell? There's no way we're following till we know a lot more. Altia? Brax asked, a little unsettled by how reluctant Yatena was. Ignore Yatena, we have to go, Altia said. There is no choice. We may even have waited too long already. The android smile returned as it grabbed the yoke of the grav car and they started to gradually advance at last into the area of new architecture, shifting architecture, that surrounded the eye. Slowly, slowly, Nave said, let the first group of drones get ahead a little. We don't want to be all bunched up. Brax did as he was told, keeping the speed of the grav car very low, as it floated forward into the dark, following the drones and Nave and Altea's car up ahead. Brax was driving so slowly that Yatena was able to open the door and step out. I'm not going, she screamed. Even though he was in the leading car, Nave had an excellent view of her through the cameras of the second group of drones, the rear guard that was following Brax's car. Yatena turned to face them as they moved slowly toward her in lockstep, one mechanical foot after another. She spread her arms and stared defiantly into their guns. Shoot me if you like, she yelled. I'm not going down there. What do we do? Nave asked. Damn, 
Brax muttered. We can't just shoot her, can we? Yatena, outside Brax's vehicle now, couldn't hear what they were saying. She hunched her shoulders and scrunched up her eyes, expecting a shot to come from the nose of one of the drones at any second, but she didn't care. She would choose death over going any further toward the eye. No, we can't shoot her, Altea said. Of course not. So we just let her go, Nave asked. When wolfhound drones detected a threat, the crosshairs painted on their video feed went red, but that wasn't happening here. The drones, even with their simple and limited intelligence, knew Yatena was a scientist and belonged to the team doing work on the Drifter planet. They simply ignored her, shifting formation only slightly to go round her, a few to her left and the rest to her right. Nave could have overridden their instincts and made them shoot her, but the thought never even crossed his mind. Yatena watched the ten drones of the rear guard march up to her, walk past her, and carry on into the corridor, leaving her alone. It was dark, and she didn't have a flashlight or a communicator. She had a small hologram projector strapped to her wrist, however, and she was able to use this to create a small pool of light ahead of her so she could see where she was going. She quickly turned and hurried back the way they had come. It wasn't far to the science station they had been holed up in. She would be able to walk to it in just a little over an hour, she calculated. She could still hear the drones moving along the corridor behind her, marching away from her. They were surprisingly silent, but she could make out the muffled clangs of metal on metal and capacitors charging with a whine just at the edge of hearing. She shook her head at the stupidity of it. The opening of the eye was the most significant thing to have happened at Drifter Prime for a very long time. It was sheer idiocy for Brax to want to keep it for himself. She was sure now that this was his goal, to own the eye the way Altea owned the Drifter ship, snatching it from below Shavia's nose. They were marching around with drones, ready to go to war after Posey's death. Brax was showing extraordinarily poor judgment in trying to be the star of this show, and on top of that, he had invited his buddies from the rebellion along. It was unconscionable. Shavir would have to be told. Yatena was suddenly distracted from thoughts of the fate that had befallen Posia and the punishments awaiting Brax by a clang of metal on metal. It was loud, like it had come from just behind her. But that couldn't be right. There was nothing behind her, was there? She didn't want to, but she forced herself to look. She slowly turned, sweeping the beam from her pitiful small lamp around. And there was nothing there. It must just have been a particularly loud clang from the marching drones. Whatever their strengths, they didn't seem to have a stealth mode. She turned away from the dim light and muffled sounds of the drones, the sounds becoming ever more silent, the illumination from their lamps slowly dimming, and she kept moving, heading for the nearest science station. Nave saw the oncoming pit through the eyes of the lead drone in the vanguard, while Altea, sitting beside him, stared at what was coming from the lasers and the sensors aboard the scout drone. We are starting to get some signal degradation, she said, which is only to be expected, I suppose, with such a deep shaft. Wait, I see the bottom. The bottom of the shaft has appeared. That's good, Knave grinned. I was starting to think it was bottomless. OK, deploying secondary arms, and our first drone is... Careful now, yes, yes, it's climbing. Wow. Will you look at that, Altea said. I didn't think they'd be able to support themselves, not with those big ostrich legs. They're more nimble than they look, Knave said. This is nothing. I've had them climbing the smooth cliffs of Ice Tomb. The cliffs below the drifter structure, Altea said, interested, despite needing to concentrate on what the scout drone was seeing. Yes, Knave said, giving her a toothy grin. Mount Fang itself.
Then his attention was snatched away as the first drone into the pit nearly lost its grip. Shit, he muttered. I'm going to need to slow them down, give them more time to calculate their movements. Do what you have to do, Altia said to him. This is science. If we're going to do this properly, taking observations as we go, then it is something that can't be rushed. Sounds good, Nave muttered, watching the drone's antics disapprovingly in a hologram screen. Oh shit, what makes that drone think that hold will support his weight? Altia tuned him out, along with his cursing of the drones in his charge. Instead, she watched the feeds coming in from the scout drone Brax had sent out ahead. The metal of the walls was becoming darker, as if it was tarnished or burnt. The hieroglyphs had become even scarcer, but they were carved bigger. They looked like tracks of fresh, shining metal among the burnt and tarnished mass of the architecture. The walls are an unusually dark shade of bronze, Brax, Altia said. Should we stop the drone? See if we can get a sample? The drone doesn't have any cutting equipment or tools. I could get it to scrape at the wall with its manipulator arm. See if that dark colour is a coating that can be scratched off. I would be interested in the results of such a test, Altia told him. The headlong rush of the corridor in the feed coming from the drone slowed and then stopped, as Brax brought it to a halt. The picture pivoted and the drone moved to the wall on its left. Altia couldn't see where the drone deployed a manipulator arm from, but she guessed it was low on the machine's body because the claw appeared in the camera's view from below. It reached out for the wall with a three-clawed silver hand on the end of its snake-like arm. The tips of the claws hesitated before actually making contact in an almost human gesture of trepidation. I'm thinking start softly, Brax said over the communicator. Just lightly brush it. I concur, Altia said, momentarily distracted by Knave's muttering that had gone up in volume as the second wolfhound climbed clumsily into the pit. That's it, he said encouragingly, his hand holding the sensor hat that he used to control the drones snugly against his scalp. You saw your friend do this. It's easy. Take your time. Altia tuned him out again and turned her attention back to her holographic display. The claw of the robot lightly caressed the wall, with barely enough pressure to register on the touch sensors in its claw tips. Powers, Altia cursed. Stop, stop, Brax, stop. It's leaving a mark. But that's what you wanted. Brax started to say before realising what he was looking at. Oh wait, that claw isn't removing surface contamination. The metal itself is being incised by the powers. That much force shouldn't even scratch plastic. How is it cutting the metal? I don't know, Altia said. We haven't seen this type of dark surface ever before here on Drifter Prime or on the Drifter ship either. What should we do now? Brax asked. I'm torn, Altia said. I want to stay and investigate this effect. I mean, what happens if we carve instructions? Will they be read? Will they be acted on? But I want to see where our exploration drone's journey will take it. I assume we will arrive at the Eye, and there may be even more significant discoveries to be made there. We have three seeker drones in total, Brax said. I can deploy a second one. It can continue investigating the new wall surface while this drone travels further. Agreed, Altia said reluctantly. It would be some time before the second drone arrived at the wall and they could continue their investigation. In the meantime, the first drone retreated back to the centre of the corridor, its arm folding away and accelerated into the unknown again. Altia watched the alien forms revealed in the small beam of light as it swept from left to right and back again across the corridor. There are so many buttresses, it's ripped here along this stretch of corridor, Altia said, almost organic, like an esophagus. Except the ribbing is still hexagonal in cross-section, Brax mused. Any hypothesis on the purpose? 
No, none, Altia said. I almost have all the first group of my wolfhounds in the shaft now, Knave said. We'll soon be able to follow them down without the danger one will lose its grip and fall on us. Then once the two grav cars are down, we can bring down the second group of drones. Fine, fine, Altia said, disinterestedly, then thought again, and on a whim decided to include Knave in what she had been discussing with Brax. Hey, Knave? Yeah? You see this ribbing? Yeah. Any idea what the purpose might be? Sure, he said confidently, which made Altea smile at his self-assurance. The spacing looks like the coils of a mass driver. It's probably for accelerating something through here, like a driver rod out of a gorse gun. Hmm, she nodded, considering this idea. Maybe. It certainly seems to be something purposeful. The second drone is in position, Brax told them via the radio. Excellent. Altea said. I want to scratch a simple line of operator text into the wall to see what happens. I'd like to see that, Brax said, raw enthusiasm leaking into his voice. It sounds magical. Like so much of the technology of the drifters, Altea agreed. Operator text is magical. At least it is tantamount to magic. Yes, like the telepathic effects you report. Brax said. I would very much like to experience that, too. Though, if drifter communications have progressed to the point that machines can link to people telepathically, and even facilitate telepathic communication between organic beings, then why bother with this text input method? Why the hieroglyphics? Let's start the grav cars, Knave said, interrupting them. We can float down the shaft now. Me and Altea will go down first, okay, Brax? I'll tell you when to follow. Okay, Brax said, while Altea just nodded absently, engrossed in what the little exploration drone was doing to the wall. I'll get it to carve an operator to increase the lighting, she muttered after a while. It's a simple task, and it can be done from here, even by a simple drone. Sounds okay. Knave said, as their grav car slowly descended the pit. There shouldn't be any way that it will come back and bite us in the ass? Hopefully not, Altea said, unless I use the wrong symbols and increase the temperature, perhaps hot enough to cook us. And you're sure you have mastered the drifter hieroglyphics and their carving? Brax's voice came over the communicator, suddenly worried by what he was hearing. I'm not sure a simple human mind can exactly master their writing system, but I am confident I can input basic commands, even from this distance, even using this relatively simple drone. OK, Brax said, if you're sure, and something simple, like adjusting the illumination, seems a good way to start. Agreed, Altea said clearly as if for the audio record, starting to carve a simple command. Now. Can I enter the pit yet, Knave? Brax asked, a note of impatience clearly audible in his artificial voice. I'd advise against it, Knave said. It's tight enough in here that, if your grav drive failed, you might take us out along with you as you fell. What are the chances of that? Brax asked now audibly annoyed with Knave. I don't know about the scientific chances, but there is an ancient law, Knave said, which says that just when you don't want something to happen is exactly the moment it will. That's superstitious nonsense, Brax said, an unnecessary delay. Just stay put for another few minutes, OK, Brax? While the two of them were arguing the point, Altea was gasping at how easy it was to carve hieroglyphs into this section of wall. She'd previously been forced to use a laser tool, and it had been slow and difficult work. Inscribing even a simple sentence had taken tens of minutes. But on this particular section of wall, using only the drone's claw, she was able to scratch the hieroglyphs necessary to alter illumination levels in just a minute or two. The only problem was that it didn't work. Damn, she muttered. 
Nothing. It should be noticeably lighter in here. Try another command, Brax suggested. OK, Altier said, and the drone's claw started moving again, leaving trails of deeply carved hieroglyphics in the wall. Altier was intent on carving, and Brax was following her every move via the drone sensors. Meanwhile, Nave was taking care of the second group of drones, which were now positioning themselves to climb down the pit walls as soon as Brax had gotten his grav car out of the way. With everyone preoccupied, nobody was watching the video that the first drone was sending back as it powered forward through the alien corridors and halls away from them. Chapter 10 Romina and Vela were wearing slim suits of form-fitting armour now, back in the storage area of their dropship. There were two of the Wender-class drones lurking in the darkness nearby, and a small table set up in the huge space too. Their new boss was sitting at the table, waiting for Princess Thagora. She turned to Romina and Vela. Remember you two, she said. Not a word out of either of your mouths, not unless you are directly asked for an opinion. Got it? Yes, boss, Romina said evenly. And from your rank to her, every single utterance had better be accompanied by calling her Exalted Highness, okay? Yes, boss, Romina said. Keep your helmets tucked under your left arms and try to look like professional soldiers, the archaeologist said not deadbeat mercenaries. On second thoughts, just put the helmets on. Oh, and you might hear me call her Highness, but for you two slugs, she's Exalted Highness. Have you got that? Yes, boss, Romina said. And oh, but whatever fresh reminder or admonishment the archaeologist was going to give them would have been, it was cut short by a soft chime. The archaeologist gulped subconsciously and froze, her finger in mid-wag toward her underlings. She slowly turned round and tried to compose herself. A minute passed, then another, as Farron fidgeted and shifted in her chair. She switched on a hologram projector mounted at the side of the table, then switched it off again. Then, Twenty yards away across the hangar space, a large armoured door started to move to the side. It opened just wide enough to allow a single person to enter. But first came a robot, a very expensive and capable-looking design. Vela ran an experienced eye over it, ignoring the sapphire finish of its transparent armour, looking for indicators of how strong its actuators were. How robust the skeleton! She looked for heat sinks, a surefire indicator of how capable its power source was. And she looked for anything that might be a blaster. The design was holding some kind of melee weapon, half spear, half cleaver, in one hand. But she couldn't see a blaster, or the telltale muzzle of a mass driver, or the lens of a laser. Then she spotted it, in the centre of its chest, a laser lens disguised among the royal crest of Thagora's family that was embossed on the mechanoid's chest. It looked like a very capable bodyguard indeed, but she was also confident her drones could crush it if need be. It was followed by a second identical mechanoid, and then the princess herself. It was impossible to know how old the woman was. She had had so many beauty treatments, interventions and operations that she had become just a bland echo of the characteristics considered beautiful in this quadrant of space. Vela was glad she had her helmet on, and the princess would be unable to see the look of contempt that flashed across her face. Two more of the robots followed the princess as she strode among them, her movements aping the strutting of a model on a catwalk. She went directly to the small table and flounced into the chair opposite Vela's new boss. The movement, a sudden drop, 
accompanied by the fluttering of her robes as she crossed her arms across her lap, her eyes narrowed, suspicious. Your Highness, Farron said, welcome. Would you like something to drink? The princess simply nodded, and the archaeologist looked off into the shadows at the extremities of the huge hangar space. She raised her arm high in the air and pointed to the table. A simple robot, rated below artificial intelligence, came speeding over on four caster wheels. It placed a tall glass of something pink in front of both the archaeologist and the princess. Well, your highness, Farron said, but she was interrupted by the princess, her voice petulant and whiny. Is my temple finally ready? she asked. I'm sorry, your highness, the archaeologist said, but I'm afraid it isn't. The guardian robot standing to the right of the princess shifted its grip on the ceremonial but still deadly halberd it was carrying, as if getting ready for a swing at the archaeologist's neck if its mistress should order it. Vela had heard stories of nobles ordering such summary executions, but only in incidents from history, as far as she knew. The robot must be from an earlier time, she realised, an ancient machine, probably with full artificial intelligence, willing to kill at a gesture from its owner. It was disgusting, a thinking being forced into such a subservient role. She shuddered, once again glad that the faceplate of her armour was hiding her expression. Why not? the princess asked. The incident has meant that I have had to arrange for new specialists and equipment to join my team, the archaeologist said, gesturing to Romina and Vela, with the drones towering seven feet tall behind them. An incident? This was the first Vela was hearing of an incident. It made sense, of course. Nobody paid top dollar for a dropship full of cutting-edge drones, just to help with the digging. She would have been happier if somebody had seen fit to tell her about it beforehand, obviously. But she was also experienced enough to know this wasn't how things worked. For a slug like her, everything was on a need-to-know basis. There could be no more spending, the princess said. Do you understand? The money you have spent is already at a level where it might come to my father's attention. Vela's mind was again boggled. She glanced around the hangar space, counted the drones, appraised the stacks of munitions, guessed at the price of the dropship itself based on the size of the hangar. She only had a vague inkling of the cost of military equipment, but she knew that all the war gear amassed around her was enormously expensive, and the princess had bought it all from her pocket money. It was beyond comprehension. Of course, your highness, the archaeologist said. I am confident we have everything we need to make sure a similar incident does not reoccur. The princess simply nodded, but she seemed somewhat mollified. How long? the princess asked. How long before you have finished with your infernal tinkering and I can have my planet back? I don't like the thought of other people traipsing about there. It is my planet, intended for me alone. She had said her planet, for her alone. Vela almost gasped out loud at the thought of it. She knew the super-rich could afford to buy whole planets, but to actually see such a fabulously wealthy creature in front of her very eyes was somehow impressive. She was impressed, she admitted, despite herself. She didn't want to be. She wished things like this didn't matter to her, but apparently they did. A matter of weeks at most, Farron promised. There is one thing, though. I still think we need to report this to the science ministry. No, the princess barked. I don't want hordes of scientists crawling all over my folly. No. They were back at work, investigating the temple the next day, with one drone inside, while they waited outside in a grav truck. Vela moved the Wender-class drone as near as she dared to the mess and bathed it in light. It was very obviously a pile of human remains. 
by the powers, Romina softly swore, her electronic rasp of a voice making the oath sound even more blasphemous than it already was. What is this? Vela asked. It is the remains of my former colleagues, Farron said. Three people lie here dead and decaying, who were among the greatest independent xenoarchaeologists in this sector. It's obscene that a wild animal should be allowed to take them from us. Obscene. The view in front of them became even sharper as the drone relaying the pictures focused more of its attention, more of the processing power of its sensor suite, onto the mess. The three bodies were very decayed, and the attack on them looked like it had been frenzied, making it hard to tell where one body ended and another began. It looks like they were huddled together in terror, Vela said, at the end. There was something that made it even more difficult to make out recognisable features in the mess. There were clouds of the planet's insects, attracted by the putrefaction. Like all the life forms on the planet, they had been designed to be beautiful, with colourful wings and jewel-like bodies. But their beauty didn't make them any less interested in sinking their proboscises into the putrid flesh to feed. I can't look, Farron said, symbolically turning her back, though this had no effect on the images, which continued to be transmitted to her head-up display anyway. Sure. Romina said, surprising sympathy in her voice. Vela, kill the feed to Farron's suit. No, Farron said, turning back to face the temple again. Wait, there's something strange about the remains. Yes, they're a mess, Romina agreed. No, that's just the thing, Farron whispered. They aren't. What? Vela said. She looked again at the view being transmitted by the drone and squinted, trying to make out exactly what she was looking at. She wondered if Farron was looking at the same pictures, because all she saw was a mess. There, Farron said. Wait! Powers be damned! How do I mark up this video? Can I draw a circle on it or something? A small video tutorial started playing in Farron's head-up display explaining how to add annotations that could be shared with the rest of the squad. OK, got it, she said, and a yellow box appeared in the head-up displays of Vela and Romina. What is that? Vela asked. She could see that there was something in the box, but she couldn't work out what it was. That's part of a skull, Farron told her. Yes, OK, I see it now, Vela said an incongruous note of triumph entering her voice for a second. Either of you two know anything about anatomy? Farron asked. I know it's better to shoot somebody's centre mass, Romina said. It's much more likely to kill them than shooting them in the leg. Other than that, though, it looks like the skull of an adult male, Farron continued, ignoring her. Which means that was Yentoabin. He was a brilliant man. He didn't deserve this fate. The other two were female. There isn't enough left of them to tell which one was which. Their names were Harakin and Harzantia, both just as gifted as Yentoabin, if not more so in the case of Harzantia. She was the team leader. We worked very closely together. I was her assistant. You were the assistant, Vela blurted out, not the leader. None of that is important now, Farron said, dragging herself from her reverie with an effort of will. The important thing is Yentoabin's skull. What about it? Romina asked. I can see a couple of data jacks. I'm guessing that's not too unusual among scientists. Sure, right, it helps with data analysis, Farron confirmed dismissively. That's not it. Look! It's been broken open like a nut. She's right, Vela said, recognizing the damage from her youth, chopping fruit from her planet's vines. The damage looks like it's been opened up, like a yen fruit. I still don't get it, Romina said. A touch of annoyance could now be heard in her voice. I'm just a simple soldier. 
Spell this out for me. That damage wasn't done by the claw of an animal, Farron explained. Look at it. Look how straight it is. That looks like a cut made with a tool of some sort. By the powers, you're right, Romina said. And it's not the only one, Vela added. Look, some of the bones have been broken and splintered. Arms and legs, Farron interrupted. But some have been cut, Vela continued. The skulls and some ribs, Farron said. The skulls and ribs have been cut. Ugh, that's weird, Vela muttered. What would do that? No idea, Farron whispered. And why would they do that? Vela said, a little louder. Again, Farron said, her voice still a whisper. No idea. I think I know, Romina said, her words more electronic than usual, as though the human part of her voice box didn't want to be involved in forming the sounds. The limbs were broken to immobilize the victims, and then the hostile cut them open and feasted on the heart and the brain. There was a silence, as both Vela and Farron wondered how likely such a grisly scenario really was. And they were probably still alive, Romina added. I mean, otherwise, what would be the point of immobilizing them? Okay, that's it. Farron said. That's enough for today. Abort mission. Abort mission. Pull your drone out, Vela. I don't want to even look at that temple again until we've worked out what in the name of the powers we've just seen. Okay, Romina agreed. We got a bunch of good intelligence here. Let's go study it and try and work out what is happening here. But Vela? Yes? Leave the drone where it is. Farron, Romina and Vela went back to the dropship, climbed the ramp, and each silently went to their quarters. It was an hour later before Farron sent a request through the ship's communications net for them to assemble in the dropship's ready room to try and make sense of the day's events. Vela was the first to arrive. Long training in the ground assault divisions of the Tarazet Space Navy had taught her never to be late to appointments called by her superiors. The penalties could be extremely severe, though she had also learned that this rule didn't apply to the officers themselves. They turned up to meetings when they were good and ready. She glanced round the room, looking for a good spot to wait. The room was in the nose of the dropship, high above the entrance ramp, with a panoramic view of the landscape out front. She went over to a couch that was built into a column between the giant slabs of transparent armour that made up the room's windows. There was a ring-shaped desk in the centre of the room, surrounding a hologram projector pit, but the hologram was switched off, so she turned her head to gaze out the window. The world was beautiful, designed for a princess, with rolling hills of blue or green, depending on the type of grass growing on it, enchanted patches of forest with trees heavy with jewel-like fruit in the valleys between, and some mountains in the distance. But the view was dominated by the lake and the temple. Vela had to admit the temple was beautiful, even though she knew what a charnel house mess lurked within hinting at alien and unknown dangers. The land between the dropship and the lake was dotted with a handful of fancy robots, which Vela guessed belonged to their princess boss, and a cordon of drones, positioned in defensive pickets of groups of three. The hologram projector behind her flickered to life with a chime, attracting her attention away from the window in time to see Farron enter the room. Farron didn't acknowledge Vela, her eyes instead drawn to what was being displayed in the hologram. It was an abstract representation of what they had found in the corridor. The bones were clearly marked, with fractures and breaks highlighted in red, while cuts to the bone were highlighted in blue. Farron didn't stop staring at it, her eyes unreadable, until Romina entered a few minutes later. Okay. Romina said, without bothering with salutations. Let's get started. 
Vella went over to join the other two ladies at the circular table, all three of them staring at the hologram and the horrors it displayed. Is this from recordings? Farron asked, or is it coming in live from the drone you left in the complex? Vella, Ramina prompted. The drone was hers, so answering questions about the data feed was her responsibility. This is live, Vella said. Okay, Farron nodded, then glanced away from the hologram. She looked out the window at the temple beside the lake, sitting so serene among the sculpted and artificial beauty of the planet. Any sign of the alien life form? No, Vela said. The drone will sound the alarm if it sees any potential threat in there. Farron nodded, watching the planet's yellow sun gradually lower toward the horizon as shadows thickened between the trees of the forest and the shadows cast by the temple towers lengthened in the direction of the dropship, like skeletal fingers reaching for it. We have one drone positioned within the structure, Ramina said. A ring of ten drones around the structure and a protective force of drones between the dropship and the structure. We also have a reserve of drones available in the racks on board the dropship. We can commit more units to searching for the creature at any moment. Two teams of four drones, for example, doing an autonomous sweep. No, Farron interrupted without looking at Romina. I'm still a scientist, and this is still a site of outstanding scientific interest. We will not simply go stomping around in there. Okay, you're the boss, Romina said. So what are we going to do? In all likelihood, Farron said, one single drone should be plenty to deal with a life form, whatever it is. Its armament is formidable, I take it? Yes, Romina nodded. Vela, the details. The drone we have stationed inside the structure has only one weapon, a heavy blaster pistol. It fires a charge of focused energy sufficient to penetrate heavy armor. No organic life form I have ever encountered would be able to withstand an attack from this pistol. The drone's other hand is free for melee combat. It is capable of swinging and impacting with something near the force of a wrecking ball. An organic creature with no armour would simply be splattered by a single punch. Let us try to keep our language dispassionate and scientific, Farron said. Though I agree, an organic creature robust enough to pose a threat to your drone would be very rare. If only we had thought to bring such equipment to start with. Farron's words trailed off her eyes drawn again to the holographic display showing what was left of the other scientists from that ill-fated expedition. There is another possibility, Romina suggested. Oh, Farron said, and what would that be? After seeing these clean cuts, Romina pointed at the hologram, where the damage to the bones was clear to see, we have to consider the possibility that the hostile isn't organic, that it is a drone a robot, or some other defense system. No, I don't buy it, Farron said. The most likely explanation is that some kind of hibernating life form was brought to this planet along with the temple. It was awoken by our investigation and attacked the first group of scientists it met, either for food or to defend its territory. The structure is inert. It doesn't have defense systems. Romina stared at Farron, unhappy that their boss was ignoring what seemed to her to be a very possible threat. When you say it doesn't have defences, Romina said, do you mean it never had defences, or that its defences are currently inactive? Well, of course, Farron said, there may have been defences at some point. The temple dates from the third dynasty of a starfaring culture, the Da'yethan. They were at least as advanced in their technology as we are, perhaps more so. So, there might be some rogue system in there, Romina pressed, that has been triggered and is now defending the structure. There might, Farron said with a sigh of resignation. Would that alter our strategy in any particular way? Without knowing the capabilities of whatever defense system it is, Romina said, 
No. Then we proceed as I see fit, Farron said. I will continue to analyze the information we have, and you two do what you're told. Ramina nodded, while Farron's attention went back to the hologram. She touched an input field projected above the desk in front of her, turning the mess this way and that. Then she switched view entirely, making the hologram display the walls of the structure. She panned left and right, studying the detail of the architecture and its markings. Oh, she suddenly said. Oh what? Romina asked. This wall, Farron said. It isn't the work of Diethan architects. It's older, more complex. The technology here is drifter technology. How long were you working here before the attack? Romina asked. How did you not see that? It seems this environment is changing, Farron said. It's in flux. All of this drifter technology was hidden before, under a layer of later additions. If I had known this was built by the drifters, Farron's words trailed off. What? What if you'd known? Vela demanded. It doesn't matter, Farron said, with a shake of the head. It's too late now. How does that affect my guess about the defense systems? Romina asked. It doesn't, Farron assured her. All drifted technology is inert, dead, defunct. It can't hurt us. What about the drifter ship? Vela asked. The Rebellion has a drifter ship, and it works, and it can do things that no other ship can do. Rumors, Romina growled. Propaganda and disinformation. Exactly, Farron backed her up. One of the first things you'll learn when you're training to be a xenoarchaeologist is that drifted technology is dead. Nobody has ever found a working artifact, no matter what the Rebellion would have you believe, Farron said. No, we're dealing with some kind of robust life form that can remain dormant for extended periods of time. Our next move is to... Farron's words trailed off in shock. The image being provided to them had suddenly cut out, and there had been a sound. It wasn't the usual sound of static or feedback that might accompany a malfunction of the equipment. It had been a screech. Where did the picture go, Vela? Romina demanded. Vela pulled out a drone control helmet and slipped it on her head, feeling the electrodes searching for the locations they were supposed to be, squirming into position and attaching. It's gone, Vela said. I can't contact it. Great, Romina said, her voice a grunt of displeasure. Should I send a couple of other drones to see what happened? What is its programming if contact is lost? To stay put and wait for it to re-establish. Okay, Romina nodded. Send a couple of drones to see what has happened. Chapter 11 A chime sounded, attracting Altir and Nave's attention to the hologram with the information being sent from the probe. It had become a blank plane of slightly shimmering, semi-transparent green. At the centre of the blank expanse of green, two words floated. No signal. What happened? Altir asked. I don't know, Nave said. Brax's voice came over the communicator. I don't know if you're watching the feed, but we just lost contact with the drone. Let me rewind the footage a little and see what happened to it. The blank green expanse was suddenly replaced by an image of dark corridor walls sliding past as the drone continued along the corridor. Then there was movement ahead. Damn, Nave said. A military drone would have reported movement like that. This little idiot is just gliding stupidly onward. The drone simply carried on, not even altering its speed toward the movement in the shadows up ahead in the corridor. There was a sudden burst of activity to the drone's right, an impression of leathery membranes and claws, and then the picture disappeared, replaced by the no-signal message. Did that look like a dark wing to you two? Again Brax on the comms the trepidation in his voice very clearly audible. I mean, did you see that? 
Was it a specimen of the servitor species you encountered? We've only seen one of them, Nave said. For all we know, there might only be one of them, Altea said. But that wing, that claw, the relative size. Huge, yes, Nave nodded. I guess it could be. Of course, Brax murmured. The trepidation in his voice could clearly be heard turning to reverence, even over the communication link between the two vehicles. What else could it be? The big question is, why is it exhibiting such hostile behaviour? Altia asked. The behaviour of the specimen we encountered was nothing like this. I don't know, maybe it has gone crazy, trapped below the surface of Drifter Prime, Nave said. That is a lot of assumptions, Altia said. OK, how about some data? How far up ahead was the science drone when you lost it? Nave asked. Two miles, Brax answered. Why? Then that's how far away our creature is, Nave said. That's why. And that is not far at all. Our drones could cover that in minutes. And I'm sure the Darkwing is just as fast, if not faster. It takes the breath away just to think about it. Brax said, and again, Nave could hear a note of reverence in the android's voice that, for some reason, he was not happy about. What do we do? Altia asked. We bug out, Nave said. We continue, Brax said, and we try to make contact. You told me you had communicated with one of the creatures before, Altia. If you did it once, you can do it again. I don't know if I really did, Altia said. You did, Nave said. How else do you explain what happened? It had given up, and you made it come fully alive again. How? Brax asked. How did you do that? I entered a deep trance-like state, Altia said. But there was some life in the drifter architecture we were within when we made contact. The architecture created an information cloud. The Sea of Memories, Nave interrupted. Yes, Altea confirmed. What the drifters call the Sea of Memories. But this area is lifeless. There is no cloud of information I can access that will allow me to make contact, to communicate. Maybe that's why it's so mad, Nave suggested. Maybe it needs the Sea of Memories to keep its head together. I know some robots like that, designed to be used in one location. Their minds are only partially located within their bodies. The rest is kept on. This is all just more unscientific supposition, Knave, Brax said. Are you sure there isn't any hint of this data space? The architecture here is undergoing changes and transformations. It can't be completely dead, can it? Since arriving, I have twice tried to access the Sea of Memories, Altea told him. I had no success either time. Try again, Brax told her. We have to make contact. We have to find out what is happening here. Whatever it is, it's significant. That much is self-evident. The eye is opening, and we have to get to it. We have to know as much as we can. Okay, Altea said. She settled back in her seat and closed her eyes. Nave looked at her, then looked out of the vehicle windows. He could see his drones moving in the dark of the corridor, setting up an optimal defensive perimeter ahead of and behind the vehicles. We don't have time for this. I told you, we have contact with my forward drones, Nave said. The Darkwing is approaching them. What do you want me to do? Do I start firing? Will that disrupt Altia's chances of communicating with it? Brax asked. Shouldn't, Nave told him. Last time she did this, she was in a suit of power armour and taking fire from all sides. It doesn't matter what is going on around her. She can contact the data sphere. OK, Brax said. You can shoot, but only in self-defence, OK? Try not to kill the specimen if you don't have to. OK, Nave confirmed. His voice was grim giving the clipped answers of a man concentrating on his work. In the midst of monitoring his drones, checking their orders to make sure they wouldn't make the first move, he glanced to the side. 
Altea's physical body was right beside him, but her spirit no longer was. He recognised the look in her eyes, an absence, as the eyelid slid slowly closed. Her body may have been beside him, in the small vehicle's co-driver seat, but her essence was somewhere else. Hey Brax, he said into the communicator, I think she might have made contact with that data sphere. Altea was descending towards an endless sea, floating down through low cloud that was punctured here and there by towers. The towers rose from the sea itself, completely unmoored from any hint of solid land, before reaching up for the clouds and continuing on upward, up to some unseen place above. She knew the place well. It was the interface of the sea of memories, filling her mind and fooling her senses. For her now, it was completely real, even though she knew her body wasn't really here, only her mind. She jackknifed in the air so that she was diving head first instead of feet first and positioned her body for a deep dive. She was hundreds of feet above the water, she guessed, and fear suddenly gripped her heart. She wasn't sure if a dive from such an enormous height was survivable. It was one thing to be pretty sure she wasn't in any real physical danger, but it was entirely another to be in freefall. It felt like she was falling more slowly than would be expected under standard gravity, which reassured her a little, but she was still pretty sure that hitting the water was going to be punishing. She just had time to do some rather less than comforting mental calculations about terminal velocity before she hit the surface, her fingertips, shoulders and head stinging as they felt the impact. Her momentum took her deep beneath the waves, on and on into the dark depths of the inky ocean, cloudy with swirls of dark sediment suspended in the water, and right at the bottom of her dive, when her downward momentum was finally exhausted, she saw shapes below her. They were huge marine creatures with various numbers of diamond-shaped limbs and long serpentile tails. One glanced up at her, and she saw six eyes burning amber in the dark before the beast lost interest and its gaze moved away. She started to swim for the surface, terrified that she wouldn't make it back before the air in her lungs was exhausted. She forced herself to be calm, to keep her lips clamped shut, and swam upward with powerful strokes. At last she could see the surface above her, a faint oval of bubbles still there to show where she had hit, but she couldn't work out how far above her the surface was. She was out of oxygen, of that she was sure, and it still seemed so far above her. Her eyelids felt heavy, her arms screamed at her, refusing to move, but she still had some strength in her legs, so she kept kicking, striving for the surface, and at last she emerged gasping into the air. By the powers, she grunted minutes later, when she could at last catch her breath without gasping and retching. Her insertions into the sea of memories had always been more gentle than this in the past. She still hadn't decided on the most fitting way to describe this place, an information sphere, a simulated space, a hallucination, a dream, or some combination of these mixed in just the right proportions to create something entirely terrifying and new. But whatever it was, she had never wondered before if it had the ability to pose some kind of physical threat to her. After the dive, she was suddenly not so sure that she wasn't mistaken, that she could perhaps suffer physical injury caused by this place. What was that? she yelled into the fog around her. Was that a warning? Am I supposed to be frightened? Do I need to be more careful here than I have been before? No answer came. Instead, her words just echoed strangely from the towers she could make out, rising from the sea around her. The sea was rougher than usual this time, too. The waves were high, raising her up as they approached and lowering her down again as they rolled by. She could see them crashing into the towers, 
breaking apart against whatever alien material the towers were built from and sending showers of spume and spray through the air as they collapsed, exhaustedly back to rejoin the mass of water. Except it wasn't water. It was natural to think of it as water, but it wasn't that. It was some complex mix of chemicals, organics and nanotechnology that tasted like brine when she inadvertently swallowed a mouthful. But it had an aftertaste, a tang of iron, like the metallic tang of blood. Then she saw it, the dark wing, crouched on a balcony built into the side of one of the towers a few hundred yards above the waves. It wasn't looking at her. It was busy doing something at the junction where the balcony abutted the side of the tower. Altea squinted, trying to work out what she was seeing. With the distance, the fog, the fact that the creature had its back to her, the difficult angle she was looking at the creature from, so far down below, and not least the fact that the waves kept breaking over her head, making her eyes sting, it was difficult to be sure what the creature was up to. Then it stood back, like a sculptor assessing the day's work, and Altea saw that the dark wing had torn a jagged hole in the material of the tower, exposing systems and conduits beneath. What are you doing? she screamed suddenly, incensed that any being would vandalise something as unique as the Sea of Memories. The creature heard her. It slowly turned its head to look in the direction her scream had come from, eyes scanning the waves for her. Through the windows of the dropship, Vela watched as a huge cloud of small birds wheeled, dove and climbed in the sky above the temple, away in the distance, their wings changing colour and scintillating in the sun as the feathers were caught by its light at different angles. They sang as they flew, a tune designed to bring joy to the heart. Whoever had designed the pleasure planet's biosphere, they were certainly detail-orientated. This is all too pretty, Romina said, almost spitting the words out. The two drones are entering the temple now, Vela said. I don't think we should keep calling it by that name, Farron said. It is no longer a temple. The purpose of this structure is hard to guess at, but I doubt it is worship of anything we might consider holy. Sure, boss, Romina said. How about Drifter Structure? Yes, Farron said. That is a much more fitting description. They all three watched images of the drones moving through the corridors of the structure, transmitted to them by the drones' cameras and sensors. Farron had found such images disorientating at first because they showed a 360-degree view around each drone. The area to the drone's front was slightly larger, slightly more in focus, but she could see the small hexagonal patch of light the drone was moving away from just as easily as the shadows it was fearlessly marching into. Vela saw it all even more vividly, thanks to the neural cow she was wearing in order to control the drones. To her, it felt very much like she was actually inhabiting the body of the drone on the right, the drone alongside her on her left, slaved to follow her lead. She also felt the other two watching the images the drones were transmitting, a feeling like the awareness that somebody was reading over her shoulder on a crowded grav transport. She wasn't sure if it was her imagination or some haptic feedback provided by the designer of the drone interface, but it was such a distinct feeling she suspected it was the second. And then she saw the drone they had sent in previously, or what was left of it. Visual contact with WEND-01, she said, using the drone's mission identifier. It looks totaled. I can see that, Romina said. Can you tell what kind of attack it was? Mass drivers? Blasters? I don't see cratering or burns to the armour, Vela said. It looks like physical blows. Some of the bigger buzzers, the ones the size of tanks, can bang a drone up like this. I see blunt impacts and slashes. If I didn't know better, I would say buzzers did this. 
Nope, Ramina contradicted her. Buzzers only use physical force if they lose their ranged weapons for some reason. Buzzers would have blasted it. They wouldn't have beat it up. It looks like Wend-01 put up a fight, Vela said pensively. She was examining the remains closely now, and she could see the charge monitor on the drone's blaster pistol. It was down a few percentage points. So there was a fight, Romina said. Definitely, Vela confirmed. I can see impact craters in the walls round us. Wend-01 did some shooting. I don't know if it hit anything, but it definitely did some shooting. We didn't see that on the feed, Farron said. The way the feed cut out, I assume the drone had been destroyed instantly. I guess the communications were blocked, Romina said, which is difficult to do, but not impossible. Vela, see if you can get any recordings of what happened after the link went down from Wend 01's onboard memory cores. Sure, Vela said, and the drone her attention was inhabiting stooped down to its fallen comrade. The data port on the back of its head was too badly damaged to jack into, which left two more on either side of the torso, round about where a kidney punch would be delivered. The one on the left was slashed, and the one on the right was mashed. Romina could see the mess just as well as Vela could. Forget jacking in, Romina said. Just remove the head and bring it back. We'll see if we can get any data out of that. Okay. Vela said. One look at the drone's neck told her it would be a waste of time trying to release the coupling and remove the head cleanly. Instead, she reached for a laser-sharp combat knife that was in a sheath attached to the thigh of the drone her consciousness was riding within. The thing was a monstrous weapon, ridiculously oversized for human use, but perfect for the towering Wender-class drones with their powerful combat fists. Using the drone's arm and wrist actuators, she started delicately removing the head with the tip of the dagger. It was unsettling seeing the way the knife slid through heavy plastic, metal and even armour, as if it was some soft organic structure. As she was working, her gaze wandered to the decaying human remains that still hadn't been recovered from the site. As before, there was a small cloud of bejeweled insects fluttering and feeding, and then she saw the drone to her left tense up and draw its blaster pistol. Like the knife, it was hugely oversized for human use. It was designated as a pistol only because the drone could use it accurately in one hand. It was at least as powerful as the biggest gun a human could use without the aid of power armour, if not more so. Theoretically, it could easily vaporise whatever kind of wildlife was plaguing the site. Theoretically. But she'd never encountered wildlife that could get the better of a combat drone. Her slaved companion drone wasn't firing, but it was looking down the corridor, eyes shining as it engaged active sensors, its pistol twitching right and left. What's that? Vela asked. What can Wend-03 see? There's nothing on the monitor, Romina said. Just dark corridor. I'm putting on a neural cowl and taking direct control of Wend-03. I'll be with you in a second. Vela's practiced eye easily detected the transition from the sharp mechanical movements of the drone's own intelligence to the smooth movements of direct human control as Romina's conscious started to control it. Do you see anything? Vela asked as she straightened up, laser knife in one hand, severed drone head in the other, and stared in the same direction her companion was looking. No, Romina said. Nothing suspicious. A false positive from all these damn bugs, maybe. Then it came. A huge shape emerging from a small patch of darkness that shouldn't have been big enough to hide it. Run, Romina said even as she started firing with her blaster pistol. Get that head out of here while I deal with this hostile. Vela was impressed at Romina's composure, and for a fleeting second even wondered if she had had her fear removed at the same time as her voice box. 
But then the thought was gone and she was running for the exit as per her orders. She heard titanic blows being struck behind her and the sharp searing noise of blaster bolts mingled with impacts as the bolts scorched and cratered the corridor walls. As she ran, she could watch the grim combat happening behind her thanks to her all-round vision, but she couldn't concentrate on the images because her attention was on what was in front of her. She'd had an impression of a huge black shape towering over the drone Romina was controlling, which sent a cold shiver down her spine. The drones were huge, but they only came up to this creature's thigh. The connection between her neural cowl and the drone started to glitch and drop packets of information. She quickly instructed Wen-02 to keep running if she got kicked out for good. For the moment, though, she was still there, still in control of the drone. She caught a glimpse of Romina's drone going down behind her, leaving just the creature standing among the trampled remains of the humans that had been there so long, and now two drones that had recently joined them. She thought it looked anthropomorphic, but winged, and the musculature was slightly wrong, or maybe completely crazy, but the worst thing was the head. While the rest of the creature's body was covered in black flesh, the head was white bone, smooth white bone, and then her link was broken completely, and she was back on the dropship with Farron and Romina. Romina was already pulling off her cowl. I lost contact with Wen-03, Romina said, and I don't think it's going to survive. It didn't, Vela said, pulling off her cowl. I saw it go down with my 360 view. What about Wen-02? Romina asked. Vela shrugged and went over to the big floor-to-ceiling windows to gaze at the view of the temple. I don't know, she said. It was fine when the connection dropped, but the monster had its eye on me. Farron and Romina came over to join her at the window, and they all saw when Zero Two come sprinting out at the same moment. Yes, Vella grunted, moving her arm halfway toward punching the air in a gesture of triumph, but then thinking better of it. The drone came thumping down the ramp that had been erected at the entrance and headed for the dropship. As it came, their control systems managed to reconnect with it, and the darkened hologram screens came to life again, showing the view through Wend 03's eyes. Vela went back to the drone control console, closely followed by Romina, but Farron stayed at the window, staring at the temple. The creature isn't chasing the drone. It can't leave, she whispered. It's trapped in there. Chapter 12 Xenia was on the surface of the 11th planet, at the prow of a command mecha. The robot was as tall as a 30-story building, roughly anthropomorphic in shape and topped by a large, saucer-shaped head. The head was large enough to accommodate a command crew of eight people. They were commanding the mecha they were riding atop, but they were also commanding the ground battle. In the head of the robot, they were high above the battlefield, allowing their sensors and communications masts wide fields of view across the action. Far below, the mecha's two mighty feet were planted firmly, rock solid on the battlefield. The giant robot did not have to depend on gravitics to carry it forward, which was important when fighting a highly advanced and well-equipped enemy such as the Tarazet Star Empire Infantry who could deploy gravitic dampers, potentially knocking out entire battalions of grav tanks, if deployed well. The command mecha's anthropomorphic layout meant it had a tall torso that was able to house a powerful shield generator, although it had to be augmented by two shield generator vehicles that were deployed alongside it on either side. With a towering command robot, shields were vitally important of lesser importance only to its communications. The mecha needed communications to fulfil its role of tactical coordination of the battle and it needed armour and shields to survive. Everything else was secondary. 
It also had a huge mass driver cannon mounted to fire over its right shoulder, which was in almost constant use, but this was not what was going to turn the battle. What was going to turn the battle was the decisions made within the Mecca's saucer head, based on plans formed up in orbit on the flagship. The enemy were aware of this too, of course, and a hail of fire was directed at the command Mecca. Rockets and missiles came weaving towards it, lasers sought it out, trying to damage it, or trying to paint it as a target for yet other, more powerful attacks. Flechettes fell on it from orbit, iron cannon roared at it, and mass drivers hurled wads of heavy metal in its direction, but it withstood everything that came at it and continued striding inexorably forward, the mines in the saucer section, human, AI, tactical subsystems and simulations, all working with the most immediate of data, looking for the fulcrum that would turn the battle. All the members of the battle command were strapped into their chairs, their brains jacked into the mecha's local information space, those that had interfaces, the others depending on holograms to call up information. Xenia was watching them, learning a tremendous amount about running a planetary assault, but she was also watching the progress of the battle via the most old school of interfaces. She was staring out through the sheet of transparent armour mounted along the front of the mecha's apex saucer section, the head in other words. What she saw was a landscape transformed by the machines of war that were fighting across it. The ground was churned up and there were the ruins of both architecture and vehicles strewn across the mess. Both sides were using similar equipment, the same types of drones, the same types of power armour, the same mecha, the same types of atmospheric fighters, dropships, and even the shadows cast by larger units nearer to orbit were the same, and the ships beyond, up beyond the furthest orbit, were the same too. And she could also see their objective, the latest in a series of them, each one seeming to be a battle winner, before more Tarazet infantry units came dropping from orbit, more reinforcements, more hostiles to be chewed up, under their guns, and to fire in return, thinning the numbers of the invaders even further. Xenia had given up thinking this time that taking the objective really would mean a definitive end to the fighting, but without taking this objective, there would never be any end. This time it was a communications hub used, their strategic analysis said, by the Tarazet infantry for coordinating a hemisphere of units, a surprising number of them automated units. Knocking out the communications hub was predicted to bring victory inside a couple of years. Xenia gritted her teeth at the thought. Years. How had their assault bogged down so badly? For a facility promising such large rewards, it didn't look auspicious at all. It was just an absolutely huge expanse of concrete, hidden behind a curtain wall of more concrete, dotted with shield generators and weapons emplacements. The fact that it had recently rained, turning everything damp and dark didn't help, the gloomy cloud cover almost as depressing as her thoughts about how long their victory might take, if it ever came at all. Some of the explosions were large enough that their light reflected off the lower levels of the overhanging clouds, cutting jagged holes in the cloud cover and creating vistas of the atmospheric battles in the clear sunny skies above. Ground Commander, Xenia said. Yes, Lady Xenia, the Ground Commander replied, his words distorted as a rocket detonated against their shields with an explosion powerful enough to set his teeth chattering for a second. This is a hopeless mess, Xenia told him. Where is the fulcrum you promised me? This insignificant bunker ahead of us does not strike me as a battle winner. The fulcrum is here, the battle commander promised her yet again. We must just dive deeper into the fighting. 
feel it flows and find that hub. We will bring this planetary assault home, Lady Xenia. I vow it by the very powers. But when? Xenia whispered. When? Altea woke, her mouth suddenly coming open to gasp for air, and grabbed for Nave. Instinctively, her fingers found him, digging into the flesh of his arm and making him yelp. She could see his expression was serious, and that he had a neural cap on his head, half covering his face, of the type used to control drones. His attention wasn't here in the car, it was elsewhere. She glanced at the holographic display built into the dash of their vehicle and saw the view through the eyes of one of their wolfhound drones. It was in combat, and Nave was controlling it. She reached up, dug her fingers into his drone control cowl and started to yank it away. Nave reacted quickly and slapped his hands over hers to stop her. Take it off, she said. You don't need it. I do, Nave said. We have contact with the Darkwing and it is currently ripping apart our drones. I mean your armour. Your armour has a much better drone interface. It's time to activate it. Trust me, Nave, Altea said as she reached out and touched the badge on his chest. I designed this armour, I know what it can do. I trust you, Altea, Nave told her, with my life. Great, she smiled. Now get out of this vehicle and activate your armour. Nave climbed out of the small grav transport, activating his armour as he went. He felt the strange but familiar sensation of time slowing, as what felt like cold liquid metal flowed over him, spreading from the badge, rapidly spreading to cover all of him. He could now see why Altea had pushed him out. The power armour that he was now wearing was much too big to fit in the driving seat of a small grav car. By the powers, he heard Brack's voice coming over the comms. What the hell is that? That is Nave. He is wearing his armour. It is a combination of material and force field projected by the badge we wear on our chests, Altier explained. Nave didn't envy Brax. He had had the technology behind the armour badges explained to him a hundred times, and he still didn't understand it. Luckily, like most technology, you didn't need to understand it to be able to use it. His senses were now filled with a sensorium that included all his drones, each one a shining little star of intelligence. When he focused on one of the stars, it expanded to show him what the drone was seeing and what its level of ammo, shields and structural integrity were. There should have been twenty of the stars, one for each drone, but the Darkwing had already started to take a toll on them. Only seventeen were left. Then, with a terrible screech and the swing of an arm, another drone fell, leaving him sixteen. Only five of them had an unobstructed field of fire that intersected the dark wing, and they were all firing their heavy weapons, the big mass drivers mounted in their noses, smoking and glowing after firing shot after shot. It was an impressive barrage, and they were firing accurately and unhurriedly, giving their servos and gyroscopes ample time to bring their guns back on target after each hit. Yeah, Knave growled, eat lead, creature. Shot after shot thudded home into the flesh of the creature. Some of the shots seemed to splinter against its surface, as if instead of a rod of heavy metal impacting flesh, what they were actually seeing was something as fragile as an icicle hurled at a stone wall. But some shots did hit home, and when they did, gouts of alien flesh were blasted free, black and firm as the blubber of some deep-sea creature. That's gross, Nave gagged. You've halted the creature's advance, Altea said encouragingly. Well done, Nave. The creature lunged forward one massive claw gathering up a wolfhound drone while it grabbed another in its other hand. Nave saw through the drone's gun cameras how the creature's muscles tightened and flexed as it smashed the two drones into each other, causing one to lose a leg and the other's main body to be crushed almost flat. 
The strength needed to do that, Brax breathed. Only three drones now stood between the monster and where Knave was standing defiantly in front of the two grav cars. All three were firing, some rounds being shrugged off, some cratering the beast's flesh, when one shot burrowed deep into the monster's shoulder, making the beast stagger back. Its smooth, white, bone face was incapable of projecting emotion in any way a human might understand, but Knave had the feeling the monster was feeling pain and dismay. Yeah, he growled, that hurts, right? And the monster was gone, one moment standing there, blood so dark it looked black flowing and splattering from its wounds, the remains of the two incapacitated drones in its claws, and the next, it was gone. The two drones it had been holding fell to the ground with a series of clangs and crashes that echoed in the suddenly quiet corridor. The remaining three drones twitched to the left and right in confusion, trying to reacquire their target. We fended it off, Brax said, shock and awe clearly audible in his voice. I almost assumed it would be invulnerable, that it would destroy us, but... We fought it off. Yes, we did, Altea said, but at significant cost. We only have half the number of drones now that we did a few moments ago. More than half, Knave said, and maybe they're not all damaged so badly. Let me see if I can coax one or two of them back into life again. OK, Brax said, but what does this mean? Do we carry on or do we go back? I think we just conclusively proved that this is not a safe mission. We could all die down here, but we have to continue if we are to reach the eye. Let's wait a moment at least, Altea said. Who knows, if we don't continue into its domain, perhaps the creature will leave us alone. Sure, maybe, Knave said. In the meantime, Altea continued, I will examine the wall we found and Knave can try to regroup his army of drones. And I, Brax said, am getting a call from Shavir. By the powers, Altea said. Yes, indeed, Brax replied. While that creature was around, the long-range communicator was down, the signal virtually non-existent, just a whisper of random noise. But now... I have a hologram communication coming through, loud and clear. Accept it, Altea said impulsively. A figure appeared between the two transports, glowing an eerie green in the dark, the unmistakable form of Shavir, tall, imperious, austerely and impeccably dressed in an elaborate version of a science ministry uniform with a small emerald cap. Brax got out of his car, followed by Altea. Knave deactivated his armour, which flowed away to nothingness across his body, only the hexagonal badge left as evidence it had ever been there. The three of them gathered opposite Shavir in a small semicircle. Lady Shavir, Brax said. Brax, she said sharply, consorting with the enemy rebels, I see. Altea isn't just some rebel, milady, Brax contradicted her. She is also one of the foremost experts on drifter technology anywhere in the Tarazet Star Empire. Conceded, Shavir said, slightly nodding her head in a gesture of magnanimous agreement. I hope she has been of use to you. What in the powers has been happening here? I am told there is an increase in the activity within Drifter Prime. Yes, milady, Brack said. Not just activity. Wholesale alterations consistent with the event described as the opening of the eye. And we have encountered a creature, a creature that Altea has identified as a client species to the Drifters. She calls them Dark Wings. I see, Shavir said, glancing furtively at Altea, who studiously avoided meeting her gaze, then returning her attention to Brax. I understand there have been casualties, not that this is necessarily a bad thing. Brax simply nodded. 
It was pointless denying it. Have you worked out what is going on? What any of this chaos actually means? And is any of it any benefit to Tarazet? Shavir asked. Why don't you get lost, Shavir, you treacherous old bag? Knave snapped, his self-control deserting him. The eye is opening, bringing the power we need to take as many planets away from you as we want. We will be able to take a planet in a single day, and we're going to make sure it helps the rebellion. This is for new Tarazet, not the corrupt. Still haven't learnt any manners, knave, Shavir's hologram roared, interrupting, boasting and bravado. Ah, you've learned my name, knave said, a little note of triumph in his voice. None of this, Shavir said, ignoring him, is going to be of the slightest use to you or your ridiculous little rebellion. Look. Her hologram theatrically waved an arm, and a tactical representation of local space appeared. At its centre was a simple circle labelled Drifter Prime, and arrayed around it was a constellation of dots, each marked with a ship name and roll. Knave didn't have time to take in any detail, but he did see that a good number of them were labelled as dreadnoughts and carriers. This place is completely surrounded by the biggest concentration of military might ever seen, ever. The hologram was so detailed that Knave noticed a particle of spit fly from Shavir's mouth as she yelled these triumphant words. His eyes followed it along its parabolic arc only to see it fade into nothingness as it went outside her hologram camera's view. You may have been able to get close enough to teleport down here, but you will never teleport out. Drifter Prime will be your last resting place. Shavir, milady, Brax said. They're helping me. They are traitors and mutineers, Shavir barked. Her hologram turned away from them, but she didn't kill the connection. They heard muffled words as she talked to somebody off camera. Admiral Hagon, they heard her say, there are rebels down on Drifter Prime. Take a force down there and hunt them out. You may bring them back dead or alive. Position a force to take advantage of the opening of the eye and make sure to deny the rebels any access to it. It looks like Brax is glitching too, so feel free to reboot the plastic fool. Shavir turned back to them, a cruel smile on her face. The tactical hologram beside her was still visible, and Knave saw a carrier near Drifter Prime being highlighted. Four dropships were launched from it, each represented by a small dot, about half the size of the dot representing their mothership. Another two dropships were launched by one of the dreadnoughts. The courses of the dropships were all directly for Drifter Prime. It was too soon for Hagon himself to have boarded one of them, but it was an undeniable signal of intent. Goodbye, Shavir said, and only then did her hologram fade away. I bet you wish you hadn't answered, Knave said to Brax. I think that means your command here, in the name of the Tarazet Star Empire, has been revoked. Altia said, answered by a grim nod from Brax. My security clearance just got deleted, he said. But there will always be a place for you in New Tarazet, Altia added gently. Or I can let them reboot me to an earlier instance of my personality, Brax said, casually, though what he was talking about was absolutely barbaric. His reduced selection of facial muscles then did an excellent job of making his scowl move from grim surprise to grim determination. Why don't I help you take a look at that wall, he said. Knave went back to trying to salvage some of their incapacitated drones, while Brax and Altia went over to the wall. It's kind of hard to concentrate knowing that thing, that dark wing, could be back any time, Brax said. Really? Altia said, her curiosity slightly aroused. I would have imagined with an artificial mind it would be easier to decide what you focus your mental energies on. I guess it depends on who designed the mind, Brax said. 
mind is set up with a very healthy desire to avoid danger. Factors designated as likely to be dangerous to my survival are assigned considerable computing power, whether I like it or not. Me too, Altea said with a wan smile. So I guess we'll just have to do the best we can. Do you have any tools in your vehicle we can use for carving in this surface? As Altea asked this, she raised her hand and gestured at the wall. I'd like to start here and carry on horizontally, 